Okay, we're going to call this meeting to order. And uh, first, uh, for those who are in present, we'll stand and have a moment of reflection. Thank you. That's interesting. We actually had to stand for it this time. Okay. If you have any disclosure of pecuniary interest, you can do it now or at any point in time through the meeting. Uh, Bob Wilhelm? Wilhelm well, is uh, uh, so Professor Plan Amendment. Sorry? The official plan amendment? Yeah. Okay. Which one? Uh, Blowman's the official plan amendment oh. for Purse Yeah. Okay. Okay, any others? Good, okay. Do I have a motion to confirm the agenda? We have no alterations that I'm aware of. Doug Kellum moves, you McDermott seconds. Those in favor? It's carried. Okay, consent agenda. We have items 5.1 to 5.14. Does anyone want to see anything pulled or discussed? Councillor Hurley. Uh, 5.3 in regards to the clean fuel standard. Okay. Uh, yes, Todd? No. Or, sorry, Matt, I mean. 5.12 and 1.3, the same item. Okay. Bob Wilhelm? Uh, 5.14. 5.14. Okay, that's the Confederate flag issue. Yes. Okay, uh, do we want to move those down to other business or do you want to deal with them now? Bob? I can deal with mine very quickly. I okay. Just, I just like to see uh, Perth County request that the uh, provincial and the federal uh, governments deal with this issue through their regulatory issue. Uh, uh, what do you say, Ken? Okay. Resolution. So do you want to make a resolution that we forward that on to the provincial and federal governments as well as to the MP and MPP? Yeah. Okay. Moved by Bob Wilhelm, second by Daryl Hurley. Any discussion on that? Gary. Oh, sorry. In favor? <laughs> Gary. Uh, we might as well deal with the 5.3 and the other two as well at this time. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Yeah, 5.3 here again uh, with this clean fuel standard that is being pushed down from the, the federal government. Essentially, it's quite confusing and interesting again, as uh, Mr. Borson has alluded here. He works with the grain farmers. They have great concerns. Again, setbacks that are just enroaching on private property. And it, as he says, it, it, expropriation, you know, and it just, it's, it's happening. I'm not in favor of it. I'm sure there's many around this table read that and felt confused and concerns as well. So I, I think we need to get our MP, MPP involved in this. Um, I'd also like maybe if we could send a letter, if you would, to some of Huron County and neighboring counties with this that we don't approve of it in this. It's just, it's too much. It's too much. So, Matt, do you want to add some comments then too? Right now? Yeah, I think that like after kind of reading the, the outline that Mr. Burson attached to it, I was kind of confused as to what the government was actually proposing, but I did see the fact that they want to only credit farmland 30 meters from a waterway, but no definition on what kind of waterways, whether they're municipal drains or natural water course or, or anything. So I think we need some, some clarification from our upper levels of government exactly what they're proposing. Okay. Todd or Doug, do you have anything on that? No. Walter? Yeah, I agree with uh, the two previous speakers. I think before we make any decision on this at all, um, we should have uh, somebody come in and, and clarify and explain it in a little more detail, whether it's our member of parliament or whether it's somebody from the grain farmers. But uh, yes, the, the document that we caught was a little confusing as to exactly what's happening. And I agree. Uh, I agree with Daryl. I think uh, once we get the information that we need, then we could, uh, you know, we could forward it uh, to here in County. Uh, I'm guessing the grain farmers, I don't know if anybody else has got calls from the grain farmers. I know I've had a call from them trying to explain and wanting you to lobby uh, 
um, Minister Freeland, but um, I, I think uh, we need to collect the information first, and then you know we can we can send information or ask for support from neighboring counties. Okay, so somebody want to make a resolution to that effect, Walter? So your resolution would read. If we have somebody come in to explain this to us, yeah, yeah, whether and it, whether it be a green farmer of Ontario or a MP, yeah, like I'm thinking uh, John Nader, um, but uh, even uh, somebody that knows a little bit more about yeah. about uh, this program. And once we receive the information, then we would then we uh, just forward it on and support. Yeah, we can decide what we're going to do at that. Point okay. Time. Anybody want to second that? Uh, that would be Daryl. Uh, any comments? Those in favor of that? That's carried unanimously. Perfect. So now I have a motion that we've dealt with those. The council receives the consent agenda items 5.1. I, I had noted on Councilor Wilhelm for 5.4. No, 5. No. He was 5.3. We already. 5.3? 5.3. We've already done with this. Um, Matt was 5.1. Oh, do you want 5.1 as well? One, two, and one, three. 5.12 and 13. Okay, 12 and 13. Matt? Uh, just, uh, I'd just like to ask staff to consider looking into the, the request for this roundabout and bring information back to County Council as to what uh, we we're can, at with it all. I know it's been discussed previous and... We, we can get around an update when John's on later on. I know there's been lots of discussion back and forth uh, as to what Wellington County's timeline thought they were. It was a push two years ago yeah. well then they changed people and it became a non-push they had more they had other intersections that they wanted to deal with first it is on their radar but we'll let john update you because he's been back and forth several times with uh wellington county on this one. Oh, that's great anything else then okay sorry about that matt okay i have a motion council receives consent agenda items 5.1 to 5.14 and approves the September 3rd, 2020 council minutes. Moved by. Rhonda, second by Bob Wilhelm. Comments or questions? Not seeing any, not seeing any up there. Those in favor? It's carried. Moving on. Okay, so we are moving now to uh, public meeting. Public meeting hearings, uh, delegations, uh, and right now we're going to deal with the surplus farm dwelling proposed policy amendments. Public meeting OPA 189-01, October 20th, or October 1st, 2020. So do we need to close and go into closed session? Just we're into, council. we're going to recess council. And move into open. And move into the public, public meeting. meeting. So I have a motion that the council recess and open the public meeting at approximately 9.08. Moved by Walter, second by you. Those in favor? It's Gary. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna call this portion of the meeting to order. We need disclosure of pecuniary interest. You can do it now or at any point in time through the meeting. And I need a meeting, or Bob? I'm declaring on Bloom and Bloom's. Oh, that, this one's with the official point. Oh, okay. The Bloom's was after this. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, I need a motion to confirm the agenda for the OPA. Moved by Matt, second by you. Those in favor, that's carried. So then we move on to 4.1, public meeting for consideration. And I'm assuming I'm going to have Sally get on here and we'll let her lead the way. Sally, David, not sure who else we'll have, but. Just a little second here for. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you, I just haven't seen you yet. Yeah, I'm just, uh, there we go. Okay, there I am. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I would um, like to share some slides with you this morning. So um, Sean is gonna help me 
share my slides with you or share my screen with you. And then we will get started. Just this. Uh, it's uh, Sean. Yep. You just need to click uh, share screen at the bottom. So if you hover your mouse over the screen, and you'll see at the bottom, share some stairs. Okay. So this morning we are looking at an official plan amendment. It's number 189 and it talks about the surplus farm dwelling policies that we currently have in our official plan. And it was an amendment initiated by the County Council uh, for Perth County in February. The, the public meeting today is an opportunity for us really to explain the amendment um, it has, um, there has been notice circulating in newspapers um, early on in September about today, about the public meeting today. Um, today is one option, one way for the public to engage in this amendment. And there are certainly other ways as well. They can send things, they can send their comments and questions in in writing. They can give us a call. Um, and yesterday we launched um, a public input tool on our website. So at the bottom of the slide there, you can see the actual uh, URL for that. And we tried to make it something that um, is somewhat easy to remember. So it's uh, perthcounty.ca slash SFD for surplus farm dwelling, and then public input, no spaces. And that will be live on our website throughout the month of October to get um, to give people more opportunities to give comments and ask questions. So if someone was to visit that site, they would be given a link to the meeting um, report that, that was on the agenda for today. They will in there be able to see the text amendment itself. Um, and they will also be able to see some frequently asked Stop. questions Stop. and answers. Stop you for a sec. Yep. We're not seeing the slides that well. Okay. So, what would you suggest, Tyler? You might have to share your screen again and click on the window if it's in full screen already. Okay. That's better. So that, that's the one we need to see, but if you can go and do it as an actual slideshow, yep, and from the beginning. Is it better quality? Does that open up in its own screen? Like yeah. a secondary, secondary screen? Because mm -hmm. uh, that's the screen we need to see, and we're not seeing that one. So you, if I share it this way, can you, can you read it? Uh, if you move it over to the right side. Left side. That's better. Well, we're not seeing the slides, though. We're only seeing the... It's perfect for the people on the Zoom. Okay. Todd and I can see it right in the middle of the screen here. Uh, right. Now we can. Now we're, we're great. great. Okay. So do you want me to go back to the slideshow version or leave it like this? No, we're good. We just we just want for, for moving further on. We just thought we'd maybe crack that. Okay. Thanks, Alec. No problem. So what I'm uh, talking about right now is the um, the website for further public input. And I just want to point it out because the public meeting today is an opportunity for us to explain the amendment itself. But that gives people more information, more familiarity with what we're um, proposing. And then, you know, following the meeting today, they want to digest that and they'll still have opportunity to comment. So that's the point I was trying to make. And that at this website, um, they will be able to go find the amendment text. They will be able to see some frequently asked questions with responses. And they will have a form um, form in there where they can submit their comments and questions right into the form. And those will be um, received by email here in the planning department directly. So we can use those comments um, to gather more uh, information about how people feel about this amendment. So the public meeting today is an opportunity, like I said, to explain the whole amendment, um, hear the comments from public and questions that they might have and then to encourage further participation, um, which we've done with this 
uh, with this site and certainly by giving us a call or an email directly as well works. And um, so our contact information is in the notices that have been circulating around, but you can also find us at planning, um, planning at perthcounty.ca is our email address. So both the amendment in general, an overview, um, the, we've been implementing the surplus farm dwelling consent policies for about four years. And during that time, uh, staff and, and counselors have um, been working through how to make this work. How do we use this policy in our day-to-day to, -day to, to uh, review applications? And we've, we've had some questions along the way about um, can we make this work better? What, does, what do we mean exactly when we say this in our policy? Um, can we do it slightly differently? So there's questions that we've had and there's some things we've identified um, in using it that could be uh, just changed by sake of efficiency. So after you work with a policy for a while, you do see opportunities to, to tweak it to some degree. So that is um, the main reasons why we're looking at an amendment. And the there's five sort of subtopics that we're really getting at with the text changes. And that is um, whether the farm is surplus to an operation within Perth County, minimum lot size for the severed pieces, livestock barns and how to work, uh, how to treat those uh, with respect to these types of severances, residential and accessory uses, what, to, what does that mean, and home industry. So we're gonna get into each of these individually. So farm operations, uh, the, the policy says um, right now that in order to be eligible for a surplus farm severance in Perth County, that the farm that the house is actually surplus to needs to be located within the county. And certainly farm consolidation um, is showing us that um, businesses are crossing boundaries and that that is um, a, a common occurrence. Uh, municipal boundaries, that is. And, and so the question is, is this really a suitable measure of eligibility? And I'm drawn to the definition of um, residents for a surplus farm operation that we get from the PPS, because that's where all this stems from, is the permissions provided there for municipalities to adopt or not adopt. And, and what it says is that it's a habitable farm residence that's surplus because of farm consolidation. So the acquisition of additional farm parcels to be operated as one farm operation. So it doesn't, it doesn't get us to where the farm land holdings are, but it does say specifically, the measure is whether they're operated as one business and is this house therefore really surplus to this farm business. And we've had lots of official plan amendments um, because of this policy that we have where um, people are applying for a site specific relief from this particular um, criteria. And um, it gets approved almost every time or every time. And, and so the question that we're left with then is, is, is it holding up um, in terms of utility? Is that policy giving us um, a control that we feel we need? Is it based in land use planning? Um, is the location of, of um, land holdings critical to whether um, a, a, a house is surplus or not? And so the solution that we're proposing here is to actually remove that criteria and to evaluate farms based on their operation um, structure, not the location of their land holdings. Sally, yep. can I uh, ask a question? Sure. So on that last slide, I have a question about the word habitable. Okay. If our goal is to have more people live in the country, I, I know on a, a one coming up, the house hasn't anybody living in it for 10 or 15 years and th there's hardly any shingles on the roof, but it's up for severance, it's in Perth East. Um, is there a problem with province? If there is a standing structure there what would be the difference if somebody could fix that up or tear it down and build a new house? If our goal is to have more people live in rural Ontario. It's a judgment call on, on a case by case basis. So the eligibility is that there's a habitable dwelling there and that we are actually, 
entering the notion of creating fragmented properties in our agricultural areas because we want to preserve existing housing stock. So the judgment is whether or not something that is in disrepair to the degree of not being habitable, is that really a house that's surplus to a farm or is it a derelict building that's no longer used as, you know, usable as a house? And so um, I question why would someone apply to sever a house that's not a house that's not habitable that they haven't maintained they haven't demonstrated that they have a house there that's actually surplus to their business so um it depends on the degree of disrepair and whether or not it's reasonable to to fix the roof and yeah the rest of the house is good and move on a person can choose to do that before they apply or we could make that a condition of severance. But really, if, if someone's coming to the table with a house that is in such disrepair that it's not really um, reasonably habitable with, with some upkeep, then I question their eligibility. Sorry, and that's our policy or the province's policy? It's a professional planner's interpretation of the word habitable and what is reasonably considered habitable. And, um, and where are we going to draw the line in terms of um, somebody being able to to address it through a condition or not? Carol has a comment. Yeah, no, uh, thanks there, Doug. It's funny you mentioned that uh, in Perth East, we actually just had one come in. Now, it wasn't for se se severance, but the house had sat empty for 15 years prior to that. Since I've been a kid, it's been in total disrepair, but it was a or not disrepair total shambles but uh it did come in and the property sold and they're pouring the bucks at it you know so we got to be careful uh some people might have said that it's not habitable but the property sold and it's getting fixed up and there's building you know a garage and such so i i just i i question and we need to be careful where we hinge on this because uh <laughs> people's interpretation can be different because this house is getting fixed now and lots of people looked at it like, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we want to be careful. Basically, in all honesty, it's up to your chief building official. Could be. To happen. determine whether this is habitable or not. This isn't our call as a council. That should be your chief building official in your lower tier. It's also a question of timing from my perspective and eligibility. Um, when you apply for a severance to demonstrate to uh, sever a surplus house, it really needs to be a house at that point in time or reasonably close to being a house at that point in time or it's, its eligibility is questionable. That's not to say that someone can't fix up the house and then apply. Okay. Here we okay. The next um, item to talk about then is minimum size of lots and residential uses. So um, we look at a residential use, especially in zoning by lot terms as the house, um, but it's more than just a house. It's the whole, it's the use of that, that property. So um, it is, maybe it's a pool or a garage or the yard. Those are part and parcel of the use of a residential use. And so when we look at the residential use here, um, we do consider some of those accessory things as part of it. And certainly in a rural area, there are a few differences in what a residential use might include. And I'll just give some examples um, being, uh, maybe it's a windbreak, maybe there's um, a, a, a pond or something close to the house, maybe it's a shop or a shed, um, that they use to put a tractor into blow snow um, because blowing snow in the rural area means something a little bit different sometimes than shoveling your driveway in town. And so it's a it's just a recognition that residential use means more than simply the house and an attached garage um, and a little bit of yard. It means um, the use of the property, the maintenance of the property and a recognition, the second recognition that in the countryside in a rural area that is slightly different than what you would find in town for a rural use. So what we 
are attempting with this language is to, to acknowledge that and remove some of the prescriptive language that limits um, or really um, tells you exactly what, what is considered to be the use. Um, and it allows for us to recognize differences, um, to look at an individual property as a, as a individual place with unique characteristics and for the process to really um, evaluate strongly what is the use here. Um, and, and our overarching goal is always to protect agricultural land. The severance of a surplus house, um, it's something that we've decided to do in Perth by having these policies. Um, and so we want to do it in a really responsible way. And what we want to be able to do is to use the characteristics of the individual property to help to define what that minimum size is and to question each item and whether or not it's part of the use, whether it is contributing to the size of a property um, uh, expanding beyond, um, beyond what is truly minimal. And so the solution proposed through, through this uh, amendment is to, to recognize the differences between rural and urban and to use the unique characteristics of a property to determine truly what is minimum and to let the process um, and the guidance from that PPS uh, work through. Um, there is no set size for what makes sense or what is allowable um, for a surplus farmhouse severance. And our job as planners is to bring you what we believe the minimum size is and then for council to, to evaluate it independently as well and say, yeah, we, we can see that's, that's minimum or actually it could be smaller or, or, or bigger, I guess, is the option. But it's really about um, putting language in our official plan that reflects the goal of um, protecting agricultural land and also recognizing that these, um, these properties are not just a house and a pool and, um, and an attached garage. There are, there's a little more to it sometimes when you live in the country and there's existing building stock out there that we, that we um, can consider um, rather than um, going through the, the motions of demolishing something or removing something useful when it's actually in a pretty close proximity to the house and could be considered an accessory. So there's also a misconception out there that, um, that corners, uh, grassy corners or um, narrow strips or stands of trees or um, other, other things, maybe it's a pond, that those aren't farmable. And so maybe we, we should just put those with the house. And that's just not the case. Um, those are very legitimate things that you would find on farms throughout the county. And so it's not to, it's, it's not appropriate if we're really truly evaluating minimum size to put those things with the severed house, um, simply because of arguments around, well, they're not that useful for farming or equipment doesn't fit in there or whatever. No, those are legitimate things that you would find in farm properties. And um, they, don't, they don't get to go with the house simply because um, some of us consider them to not be that farmable. Um, it's really truly about what is minimum and how, what's you, what needs to be there to, to service that house. The next topic um, to cover then is home industry. And it kind of builds on this idea of the use and accessory. So accessory buildings, accessory uses. The idea of a home industry is actually to mimic what we already have in there for home occupations. So it's about supporting employment of varying types and allowing people to work from home, regardless of what type of work that they do. So not to discriminate against um, people whose work doesn't fit inside of a dwelling. So it's introducing some language, the home industry term, to recognize um, some people um, can make a living at home working inside their house. And we've traditionally called that a home occupation. And some people can make a living at home working in their shop or their shed or garage or what have you. And that's a, that term that I'm using 
or proposing to describe that as a home industry. The important point about introducing this provision for people is that it's about scale. And if you look at the text um, of the amendment, uh, there's a number of provisions in there that make that it help us to ensure that whether it's a home occupation or a home industry, that it's discreet and that the use of the property is still clearly residential primarily. So this is a provision for people that live there, live in that house to make a living at home. It's not for um, employees and a lot of outdoor storage and a number of vehicles. And so um, things like retail would not be a reasonable thing to, to do out of your garage to make a living from home. It's, it's about um, offering people with certain types um, of work that can be contained inside of a, an accessory structure um, to make a living doing that um, on their own property. And what I tell people, I'll just finish my thought and then get to you, Todd. What I tell people when they come in to talk about this um, is, hey, you're clearly a passionate entrepreneur and you're likely going to be successful. So what you need to know at the outset is that success in your business eventually probably means moving into town um, as your business grows or evolves. So um, that's where I'm, that's where we're coming from with this particular amendment is, is it's about scale. It's about different types of work and being able to make a living at home. Todd? Any question? Yeah, I just wanted to reference your comment about scale and uh, point out that in some cases um, we may be forced to consider um, applications of this nature wherein the uh, proposed scale of the home industry actually occupies a larger square footage than the home itself. And I'm curious about whether that's part of the criteria or the thinking that goes into approval of that is that the, the, the out structure becomes uh, much larger or, or somewhat larger even than the, the uh, home or residence on the property. Mm -hmm. And it is common in, um, in rural areas to see uh, sh structures near the house that are bigger in footprint than the house itself. And um, when you have um, when you have a little bit more space, um, it's possible to have a, a building that's physically got a bigger footprint than the house, but that the property still looks quite residential and that the the primary use is is more obviously for someone's home. And so it's 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 more than just the square footage, it's presence it's um, it's whether it's occurring inside or outside of a building, it's traffic, it's um, activity. And so at the signage, all of these things matter um, when we consider whether something is, is, is behaving and looking and feeling like an accessory use rather than a primary use. Uh so just as a supplementary then, um, as you think about the implications of uh, establishing this as, as a policy and guidance, um, are you thinking about the possibility that there is a, a checklist or a series of gates that um, the, the applicant jumps through to try to make the case that these um, home industry uh, supplementary structures are, as you say, sort of part of the fabric, but that in the intent of the law is uh, for residential purposes. Yeah, so in the text amendment, um, because home industry is a new term, there is um, a definition and some parameters listed. So there's, there's nine or 10 items that would um, give further measure or description of what the home industry could look like or could be. Um, and they're all aimed at maintaining um, it's discreteness or that it's accessory. And I would, I think it's important to mention the, you, the implementation of this is that if we adopt this amendment and we um, as a county decide um, <coughs> home industries are something that we want to permit on um, surplus farm dwelling lots, then it actually doesn't just become so. They would have, if there would have to be language in a zoning bylaw that, that permits this in an individual lower tier. 
So this is an opportunity, if passed, this would be an opportunity created by the official plan for lower tiers to allow this in the municipality. And they could adopt these parameters that I've proposed um, in the text, but they could also add to them. But this is a minimum you would have to do these things um, in order to describe or limit, um, characterize and restrict a home industry. You're okay with that, Todd? Yeah, he's nodding, yeah. Okay, anybody here got a question about that, Daryl? Yeah, just quick, yeah, great, Sally and Todd. It's, thanks for bringing that up. I, I have to agree, it's, it's concerning because a shed can easily soon be quite large and a bigger square footage. Now, lots of times uh, I know for a fact, you know, you see a shed in the rural, it's only a quarter of it or a third of it is the actual workshop and the rest is, you know, some storage area. And that's what's going to happen with these residential lots as well. You know, they have their, their boat and their RV and in the one end they're running a woodworking shop or a small machine shop. So yeah, it, it's unique and we can't be too restrictive. I'll, I'll say that, but it is exciting what's going on here and it gives our youth within these rural residential lots to, you know, have purpose to go out there and their parents to spend the money to try and get a little revenue back. So thank you. Okay, anybody else here? Not seeing any hands, not seeing any on the screen. Carry on, Sally. Okay, thank you. So next up we have livestock, livestock and barns as two items. So uh, let's talk about barns first. And again, it's, an, it's a following on the concept of accessory. So whether or not a barn could remain on a severed piece of property, if we were to implement the uh, language that I talked about with respect to the residential use and accessory uses and recognizing that there are some unique um, characteristics in, in um, a rural landscape versus an urban landscape, then what that language does is it, uh, it does provide an opportunity for us to look at a barn that's existing on a property that's in close proximity to the house and um, can be converted to not be a livestock operation, um, a structure for that use, that we could consider it to be an accessory uh, building in which someone could do their, you know, their storage or put their tractor or have their home industry. So it's not a yes or no barns are allowed or they're not allowed. It's a, it's the language if adopted around residential use being less prescriptive and more about minimum size and more about rural character that a barn could in that environment be, um, be considered an accessory. Um, and again, it would come back to the minimum size of that lot. Where is this barn located? Um, ensuring that it's not a livestock operation because that's uh, not what's being proposed is, is livestock operations on these severed uh, residential use properties. Um, and that, so that kind of talks about a barn on a severed piece of property. Sometimes um, people are, um, able to preserve these structures. And certainly in Perth County, we, we identify um, with our agricultural heritage and we recognize the value that these structures have given us over time. And so um, if they are in good shape or good repair, it's, it is good to be able to give the opportunity for them to be considered um, as something that could remain. Um, and so the, other side of that is if it's on the retained farmland, can it also, can it stay there? And we've always maintained that it can stay on the farmland portion, the farm portion of the severed lot, um, provided it could meet MDS. Um, and if it couldn't meet MDS, then they were often coming down as a condition. And so what the amendment would do is allow for the same provision that it would on the severed, that if it was no longer capable of housing livestock, meaning that certain equipment or certain capabilities of that bet of that building were removed and could be formalized through a, a permitting system then then it could stay on the retained land too as a non-livestock accessory building for that for that farm to store wagons or what have you so with respect to barns it's it's a 
it's the change that's proposed in the language is just giving that environment where a barn could be considered an accessory use, um, provided that it's no longer housing livestock or if it's on the farmland that it meets MDS. And that is somewhat separate from the conversation about livestock in that what we've, what we've come up um, with a lot is the request to keep animals on these lots. So not just, you know, the family dog, but maybe it's, maybe it's um, a 4-H project, a sheep or some rabbits or a chicken coop. And is it appropriate for people to be able to keep animals on a surplus farm dwelling lot? And so what's proposed here is that, again, we talk about scale, that what we're not talking about is livestock operations. What we're talking about is the keeping of some animals um, in, a, in a sort of a personal use way, whether they're pets or egg, providing eggs or what have you, for the people that live in that house. Um, and it is a, the way it's been proposed in the text is very small scale and is probably only useful um, to consider small numbers of small animals, but it is a small step towards this recognition of these being rural properties. And um, if you did, if you were inclined to keep a sheep and you, where would you do that if not out here? Um, so the uh, other thing to consider about the keeping of animals on the surplus um, farm dwelling lots is that I think the province has more to say about it than we've been hearing. And I am getting some in inkling that they're talking about this um, in terms of the agricultural designation in general. So these severed lots still exist in the agricultural designation. And, and so the question out there that I am seeking more input on is um, in an agricultural designation, are we outsider jurisdiction to limit livestock on a, on a property of, of a smaller size? And, and that's a question that I don't have an answer for you, um, but I am working on. And there are examples out there of uh, different municipalities that are limiting the number of livestock on these severed lots, and they're doing that in various ways, some through zoning. Um, but there's less, less folks out there, less municipalities, making it part of the surplus criteria policies. And um, so I'm interested to see if, you know, and I've sent it to them to the province directly and I will be prodding them a little bit to have a conversation with me about it. Um, is this something we can limit? And if so, is this an appropriate way to do it? So I leave, I'll leave that particular part of it there that there's, there's still some information to be sought out um, and evaluating whether this is the right tool for Perth and whether we wanna have it in our surplus farm policies um, as a criteria. Any questions on this issue from Walter's got a comment? Uh, Sally, and I agree with what you're trying to do, I guess. Um, and, and certainly small animals aren't a problem, um, but um, if, I guess the concern you can end up like, where, where do you stop with it small? Um, you know, we're talking about rabbits and we're talking about sheep. A lot of these uh, younger people, uh, uh, younger families that move out to the country, you know, like they appreciate the country living. And I'm kind of speaking personally here now. If you've got girls in your family, the first thing they're going to want to do is have a horse. So, you know, how do you handle that? Do you hope because a horse certainly isn't considered a small animal, but right. one this is really it's a pet you know it's no different than a dog so mm -hmm. it, it's something that we're going to have to uh, deal with i think at, at some point in time yeah that's a great point and and what we're what text has been proposed is this notion of 10 square meters or less of housing mm -hmm. um and so it's a baby step for us in perth county right now we're not permitting any livestock on these properties and so um this is sort of a an opening of that that idea, that concept that you could keep animals on a surplus dwelling uh, lot. And so, yeah, it, it may be, maybe we don't have the mark quite set right. Um, 
if you had um, some type of, it's, it's both the type of housing and the size of the housing rather than the type of animal. So we're not saying you can't have a pony or you can't have a, um, a sheep or you can't have a goat or whatever. It, it's, it's that there is a measure out there in the minimum distance separation that says anything under 10 square meters is actually considered not like, it, it's not, it doesn't register on the scale of having to meet MDS. And so it, it's, an, it's an indicator that it's, it's considered less of a nuisance to neighboring users um, and is of a certain scale and size to not, um, to not, yeah, I guess, create incompatibilities. So it was just a measure out there that's recognized that easily can be measured that we could use to implement our baby step in allowing some animal keeping on these properties. Todd? And, and I assume, Sally, based on the, uh, if you'll pardon me using the word, the writhing that North Perth Council is going through over uh, backyard chickens at this point, that a lot of this still would be subject to bylaw uh, control as well. So the lower tier would have the opportunity, even if uh, our, our policy is more permissive, um, to restrict or to uh, be liberal to the extent of the uh, official plan amendment. Yeah, we are we are entering a, a potential system where someone comes in for a consent application of this type. They have um, I'll use an example that was recent, like it was as recent as February and someone came the house, the septic system, the laneway had all sort of given us a picture of what the minimum size of this lot was. And within that space was a small chicken coop that had capacity for like, I don't know, 10 birds maybe. And because of our current policy, we actually had to make them remove that as a condition of the severance. And at the time it seemed out of place um, that they would have to actually remove it when it was something they were using for themselves. Um, it was you know, so small in scale that it was not causing nuisance or incompatibilities. And um, the, the neighboring use is agriculture. So that was one of the things or many of those kinds of examples that prompted this like sort of baby step towards keeping the animals. But you're right, um, it, would, it would again provide the lower tier with the option of like implementing it or not through zoning. Um, and we will get into a situation, therefore, that someone comes in for a consent application and we will have to look closely at zoning in the lower tier that this property is in and say, um, it is a, it is a criteria of the official plan, but it's further restricted by the lower tier that this property is located in. And so it does, it wouldn't meet zoning and you would have to, rem if, if that zone rem or zoning bylaw said, oh, we don't permit that then it would have to be a condition again in that example of the chicken coop that it, it was removed as a condition of severance. You're good at that, Todd? Okay, any other questions, comments? Daryl? Just just quick here, yeah, no great, Sally, thanks. And the, the square footage of the building <coughs> is key, I believe. And uh, that's nice to see. And uh, like you said, we, we, we can't pick and know you can have a llama, but you can't have a horse or, you know, I, I believe it's the square footage and that is key. And uh, yeah, it, this is a good step and I, I like what I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Matt? Uh, just to maybe elaborate a little bit more on the square footage, I think if you run the numbers, like that's like 108 square feet. And I think not knowing everybody's zoning bylaws, but I think you don't even need a building permit for a, but that's more or less a garden shed. I think in Perth South, it's anything over 10 square feet. So that would be a building permit in Perth South. But that may not be in North Perth. 10 square, or like 100, 10 by 100, 100 square, square feet. 100 square feet, I mean, like 10 by 10. Yeah. So I, I think I, I don't know. I could be wrong on that. But I think that's what it is. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the screen. I'm looking down here. <laughs> Through all this, uh, Sally, I appreciate you love what we're trying to do. And, and, and you know, a comment has come up several times that uh, the surrounding uses is agriculture. 
And that's a, a kind of a key thing to keep in mind. And I think a concern of a number of, of uh, people in the rural areas that, that uh, um, are adjacent to uh, a potential severed farmhouse is uh, the impact that it may have on um, standard farm practices. And out in the rural area, there's a number of small elevator systems that at this time of year, dryers are gonna run 24 hours a day. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly in West Perth, we have a number of uh, uh, seed cleaning uh, plants and uh, from time to time, there might be you know, dust emitted from them. And that, that's a concern that, uh, that uh, people come out from, from the urban areas to a severed farmhouse and have concerns about uh, traditional farm practices that happen. And, and um, you know, I know in some cases we've, we've, we've made them sign that, that uh, you're living in an agricultural area, but the concern is there that, you know, the impact that it'll have on some of these farm operations. Any other comments or questions? I just have one more comment to your comment, and I agree with you. Uh, but I know I live in where I live, I have three separate houses all around me. So if we're going to go out and spread manure before a weekend, I'll phone up the neighbor and say, hey, you got anything big planned for the weekend? Because I was thinking of spread manure. Well, yeah, we're having a party on Saturday. So, okay, then I'll wait till Monday. They say thank you. It's never been an issue. You just you kind of have to work with the neighbors and not just be your own little entity down the middle. It, it does go a long ways. Anyway, that's my comment. Carry on, Sally. Okay, I'm on my final slide, and it is just to um, reiterate that we've gone through the amendment. Now we've sort of explained um, what we're trying to achieve, um, and now it's it's about hearing from folks, be that individuals, organizations, maybe it's agencies, maybe it's lower tiers, hear from them about what do they think about these changes? Um, are there words that are sticky for them in the text amendment? Um, is it a concept that's um, that they wanna comment on or ask a question about? And so I do encourage people to use this um, site for public engagement to give us your questions and comments I encourage people to call if they are unsure and wanna talk about it a bit before they submit comments. Um, participating in this way allows, like submitting us a, a something written using this website or using a piece of paper and, and regular old mail, provides someone with the opportunity to say, hey, I, have, I do have a question about this. I do have a comment about this. I care about this. It also gives them a chance to say, I would like to know when you make this decision, can you please send me a copy of the notice when you get the decision? Um, and that becomes our mailing list for the decision uh, at, the, at the point in time when council's ready to, to make a decision about this amendment. And it also, um, it, it, it gives us an indication of whether or not we're reflecting the community's interest. So again, this website will be up um, for the month of October, with that November then being a target to come back to town council with a recommendation about the amendment based on planning principles and public comment. Thank you, Sally. Todd? Well, I'm excited about um, the work that's been done and, and I want to express appreciation uh, from uh, my part, at least uh, for the thought that's been given. Um, I'll ask you a, a straightforward question. Have you considered stress testing um, some of uh, the wording and, and some of the impacts of the changes that are, are contemplated by the wording against real files that, that have come in over the last two years to see whether it would substantially uh, affect or impact uh, the decisions that were made um, uh, over the last two years on, on properties that have sought um, a consents? Yeah, I like that question a lot. I have, I have not sat down and written that out or put that into a chart, but since I joined the county a year ago, it's how I've looked at every severance. What would I do? What can I do today to evaluate this severance? And how would I evaluate this severance if I was given a little more freedom to use my experience and professional uh, training as a planner? 
um, to do some interpretation, to look at unique characteristics of a property. And so formalized um, stress testing that's in a, that's sort of charted, you no, know, something I could certainly do and might, and might very well entertain after this, but it is something in practice I've been doing since I came on board. And it's, these amendments didn't come out of, um, didn't come out of me sitting down and reading a whole bunch of other people, what are they doing? It came out of uh, looking at files that were coming in the door and asking um, myself, what planning principles can be applied here to answer some of the questions that we're struggling with in implementation and to create some efficiencies in our processes in implementation. And um, is there room in here um, to use land use tools and land use concepts to, um, to review and update this policy. So, and, and, and I've been doing that all along as I look at each application that comes in the door. So to some degree, the answer to your question is yes, I have stress tested it, but I haven't logged that necessarily. You good with that, Todd? Yep, thumbs up. Any comments on that in the room here? Look sideways. <laughs> Not seeing any. So I can uh, do a motion to receive Sally's report. But I think before we do that, we do have, I think, maybe one public person that's going to uh, make comment. Is Krista Hallshoff available? Do you want to do the motion uh, first? Well, I can. Receive the report, and then we'll move into the, the public comment. I can. I just thought maybe that person coming on might want to be have comments with what we talked about because it's fully within their right. She will. And she right still now. can. But okay, I have a motion. The county council receives a report entitled "Public Meeting for Surplus Farm Dwelling <laughs> Proposed Policy Amendments for Information," and the county council receives comments from the public for consideration of the official plan amendment while reserving a decision whether or not to adopt the amendment for a future council meeting date to be determined. Moved by you, second by Matt Duncan. Those in favor, that would be unanimous. So we do have at least one, I believe, person. Although I don't see any name up here yet. 10 D7. There she is. Oh, at the top. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Krista, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, now, my understanding is that the slides are going to be shared by someone. Uh, Sean, you're on that? Yep, they're up right now. Yeah, we got okay. them up. Perfect. Yeah, and I can see them. Okay, great. Um, so since I didn't get introduced, I'll do that for myself. Um, I'm Krista Holsoff. I'm Vice President for Ontario Barn Preservation. Um, I'm also Architect of Veld Architects um, in Perth County. So um, next slide, please. I'll talk fast. I was limited to five minutes, so I'll talk fast. So listen quick. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Vice President of Ontario Barn Preservation. We're a new not-for-profit organization started in 2019, and our purpose is to advocate for our heritage barns. Um, and I want to be really clear about that. We do not advocate for mandatory preservation, but we encourage voluntary preservation, reuse, and restoration, and provide resources to those uh, wanting to do so. Um, and you can learn more about us on uh, and our initiatives online. Next slide, please. All right, so not only do we believe that saving our heritage barns are important, but uh, the provincial policy also believes that our heritage um, resources are and significant cultural heritage landscapes, which I think is a key, key language here, our scenery, our rural scenery is important. Um, and uh, provincial policy and planning policies have a big influence on that. Next slide, please. 
So although um, you know our, our heritage barns don't have the same functionality they once did, we do believe that our heritage barns are an important part of our, our cultural history and our rural scenery. Um, they serve as landmarks uh, in the countryside and are part of our, our rural scenery. They have the potential to be reused and repurposed sometimes into agriculture related uses as municipalities search for value added opportunities for, for farmers and economic growth. Um, reuse of buildings uh, is a much more envi environmentally friendly um, process than demolition and using brand new virgin materials. Our barns have uh, historic value for research of vernacular architecture and cultural history uh, and for areas and communities in Ontario. Um, our barns convey an important sentiment and image to our urban counterparts and the hardworking farm community, um, and they're useful in small livestock and other small farm operations. We also recognize that there's a growing trend in adaptive reuse of our barns um, and how they can both communicate their history while serving new purposes um, in our rural communities as uh, new residences, craft breweries, agritourism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they definitely have the, barns have the ability to contribute to our, our uh, rural economic development. Next slide, please. Um, and so this uh, year, we, uh, Ontario Barn Preservation um, was made aware that the surplus farm dwelling severance policy was um, detrimental, being detrimental to our heritage barn uh, stock. And so we took it upon ourselves to do some research. We consulted with municipalities, uh, engineers, planners, architects um, uh, about the policy and what they were seeing uh, in Ontario. And we identified um, a number of policy items and a number of strategies that municipalities could use to um, help the surplus farm dwelling severance policy um, not be a detriment to our heritage barn uh, stock. So what I'm gonna go through is kind of a Coles Notes version of the letter. Um, and I hope you received it. Um, and if not, um, please, I will uh, send it to uh, the municipalities again if you've not received it. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first uh, and biggest issue we feel that the, uh, the best way to preserve uh, and at least give our heritage barns a chance um, to survive is to sever them with the residential lot. Um, they, these owners, they're, they're our ideal owners. Um, they, they see the barn as a novel asset as opposed to an obsolete, obsolete liability. Um, the owners of these small residential lots, you know, they're, whether they're uh, estate farms, uh, hobby farmers, they, you know, they have preservation um, goals, um, they might be interested in CSAs, farm gates, etc. These types of uses that, I, that we feel are very compatible to save our barns and very compatible with prime agriculture areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, by when when the barn um, does get severed with the retained agriculture lot, um, it almost guarantees the demolition of the barn um, due to factors such as minimum distance separation. It in, is an immediate violation of that. Um, there's often a lack of use or need for that barn, um, lack of interest in preservation of that barn uh, by the retained owner, um, and often in the way of cropping. Next slide, please. So. We feel that the best way to um, allow barns to be severed with the residential lot to uh, help uh, give them a chance is by uh, redefining that minimum lot area, uh, which Sally presented, um, uh, that can include not just the house septic and water, but can be considered as a case by case. Um, some municipalities are using minimum and maximum thresholds. Some are using certain uh, distances. So if the barn is within a certain distance of the house, um, it can be considered to be severed with the house. Um, but I also think that uh, the wording in the, that's been proposed also needs um, not just a look at topography and um, site, but also heritage value. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we recognize there's issues with nutrient management um, and different municipalities have taken different approaches about how to limit um, and manage the nutrient units or the amount of animals um, on the land by uh, restricting per hectare or using the OMAFRA nutrient management um, plan to help regulate um, and manage uh, the a number of livestock on properties. 
Um, and I think that could also be considered um, not just the minimum uh, barn area. Next slide, please. Um, okay, we feel that um, the, also the non-farm designation of these small residential lots are, is actually creating conflict with our prime agriculture lands. Um, that designation, I think, very uh, or encourages non-farming residents to move into these lots, which leads to more neighbor conflict and more issues. Um, we feel that where these small lots um, are created uh, and they are permitted to uh, include livestock to a certain extent, that it encourages farming owners to purchase these pro um, properties for farm startups, CSAs, um, barn reuse, and rural revitalization projects. Next slide, please. So again, we would encourage that um, this farm severance policy um, be uh, revised to encourage more agriculture related uses on these small uh, lots within limits, obviously, um, and not only for our heritage barns, but also for our, our rural economic growth. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, back one. I got ahead of myself. Um, so uh, the last note I'd like to make is, uh, you know, where a barn does need to be proven that it is not going to be used in livestock housing as we recognize that that condition is going to uh, exist. OMAFRA does distinguish that a barn or a building capable of housing animals is one with water and stalls. So by removing these two items, um, a heritage barn can be now designated proved to be an accessory or shed building rather than a livestock housing building, and thus it exempts it from the minimum distance and the nutrient management plan. I'd also like to note here that the Ontario Building Code does not distinguish a difference between a shed or a livestock agriculture building, um, and thus a permit process is very difficult to do a change of use. Um, a change of use permit would require um, a barn to be converted to a residence or um, something in part nine or part three, such as you know, a wedding event or something you know, crazy like that. Those types of changes um, often trigger structural upgrades and investment in a barn that usually is um, most, most likely unfeasible financially for a barn owner. And thus again, um, almost guarantees its demolition. Um, and so I would, I would like you to consider that the guidelines um, in the policy to designate a barn as uh, accessory, not livestock, be um, less uh, open to building code interpretation and more in line with OMAPR guidelines. Next slide, please. And so I'd like to leave you with a quote, unfortunately it got chopped off here, so I'll, I'll read it here. Um, it is possible that millions now living in North America have never seen a barn, let alone been in one. In the foreseeable future, there is more than a possibility that for many, the kind of barn illustrated in these pages and being discussed here will not be there to see. You know, too often we see these barns already falling down because of weather and, and these conditions. Um, and, and we recognize that, that we won't be able to save them all. Um, but on behalf of the Ontario Barn Preservation, we would like to encourage you to help find ways to prevent the unnecessary demolition of our heritage barns. Uh, especially in relation to the surplus farm dwelling severances. Um, and it's our hope that barns of significant cultural heritage value can be considered for future generations. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Krista. Sorry about not introducing you, but... That's okay. Uh, anyways, anybody have any comments or questions for Krista? Daryl? Yeah, no, great, thanks. It's uh, definitely been uh, one that we've struggled with here within Perth East. And I know within my, where I live within five minutes, there's three real nice bank barns, two of them that haven't had animals for 40 years. They're not real big. I've always thought to myself, if those farms did go through the severance process, what a shame, because they're right within the cluster. And, and, and again, I thank you for your work. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we go forward and times change, but it, I, I myself and I know many others have a, a soft spot for the traditional bank barn. And if we can save a few and they're within the cluster, I, I have to agree. And thanks for your work. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Not seeing any. Just so you know, Kristen, in Perth South, we have do, done two surplus farmhouse services where we did change the use of the barn, so the barn structure was allowed to stand. Perfect, good.
Uh, that's only two, and I don't think we've demolished actually very many barns, maybe one. Oh. There, there are some farmers out there demolishing very rapidly. But there, there are, and Bob Wilhelm just pointed out, there are farmers demolishing barns rapidly, and one of the reasons for that is to get a slightly reduced tax bill uh, every year, and I know that is an ongoing. That's our next project. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a, that'll be a tougher one. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, anything else to add? No. You're good. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any. Oh, Rhonda. I just have a question in terms of process now. So we've had the public meeting here. Is Sally going to go to all the lower tiers and present this? Like I think that should have been done first before it came here, according to the official plan. Well, actually, the official plan is done dealt with by the upper tier. Well, I realize this that. is just a public meeting for public input. I, I realize that, but anytime we have anything that's going to affect the official plan, it comes to lower tier first, and then it comes to upper tier. That's and what I realize changes as well. In, this is uh, a change, like the Blowman's one coming up. That's right. But I'm just wondering. Well, what, we can do that. I'm just wondering what the, the process is now. Is, is like I think this should every lower tier should have a presentation because people don't pay attention to what's going on at county council, right? Oh, I'm not saying we're not going to do it at the lower tier. No, I'm I'm just asking, we're just looking for the public input. Right, and I'm asking what the process is now. Is Sally going to go to each of the lower tiers, make a presentation, and then are we going to have another public meeting? here or how is this like this is really tough to do because the public can't come in to the building with us and talk like we did it the last time we were in Moncton we were in Stephenville we had halls full of people making comments this time around we've had Krista one right so either the public don't know what's going on and they don't care or, or they're not aware of what's happening and I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to make this that the public are well more aware of what's going on here. Well, I'll let Sally deal with this in a sec, but I will say that people were aware of it. I know Bob had people contact him. I've had people contact me what it was all about. I've had no phone calls. I, I, I shared it on social media. Sorry for speaking out. I probably had five. Yeah, so I, I know Bob. I had, a, I had a number of calls and comments on it and uh, they're all positive. And a number of them wanted to see what was being put in as far as comments from the public. And I'm glad to see that Sally's got opened that up so it's easier to put comments in. And I hope they're uh, able to view them by the public so that everyone sees comments that are, are being brought forward. But yeah, for the lower tier, yeah, I think we should be involved. Show it, show it down. Maybe we, uh, Rhonda is maybe correct, or maybe did the order ain't quite a hundred percent. But hey, I'm yeah, in for the, the, for this portion here. Like this is no different than we approved surplus farmhouse services to start with. It started at the county, then it went to the lower tiers. So Sally, I'm assuming you're going to present this to the lower tiers at some point in time when we get all the comments and everything in. Yeah, I have I have us on my schedule. Perth East has reached out and asked that I come um, next week. I believe I'm going there on the sixth. Um, and yeah, now that we've sort of opened it up, we've explained it. I am I'm getting calls as well, just like some of you have talked about. I have a better sense now about sort of what people want to talk about, and so with that information, I can now um, bring in a similar information report to the lower tiers where. We go through the amendment, we explain it. I can use the slideshow from today. And um, they can, then they can have their comments come to us um, through resolution perhaps if uh, during that meeting when, I, when I'm there, or there's, there's also the opportunity for a lower tier to submit something in writing as well. So. Todd. Well, there's no question. Uh, certainly, Sally and I have had the conversation that um, uh, North Perth Council has um, uh, interest and and will no doubt have comments. Uh, so Sally knows there's a standing invitation at North Perth as well to present this information and 
and uh, certainly I know that uh, members of the North Perth Council have expressed some concerns about some of the policy directions in this. So um, there will be a, a response. Um, I think the, the concern that we must take into account in moving forward is to make sure that there is enough uh, time for written response from North Perth Council after they've had your presentation mm -hmm. and they've had opportunity to consider this either in a small working group or, or however council chooses to, uh, to do that uh, so that they can submit uh, written comments as well. And, and that's uh, you know a good comment, Todd. Uh, like this doesn't have to be done today, tomorrow, or next week. This is a process. Like it's very important. Like we want to do it right. We want to make sure we get the comments back from the public, specifically, but the lower tiers as well, who are people of the public as well. But we need to get all the comments back before it ever comes back to the upper tier for discussion or approval or whatever. And. The timeline, Sally and I haven't talked here for a little bit. She's been pretty busy and so have I, but uh, I'm not sure what kind of timeline you're thinking, Sally. Well, I um, I think we should have, and I've put it uh, to the website now, uh, that we leave the, the engagement tool up for the month of October. And okay. that, that would give me a chance to get around to each of the lower tiers. Um, throughout that month as well. So I have reached out to all the um, CAOs and clerks a couple of times about this particular amendment, just sharing information, sharing the website launch. Um, and so now I can circle back and actually schedule some um, time on, on future meetings for the month of October. And then um, it's going to have to be a conversation with those, uh, those low, the, the lower tier councils of whether they they do intend to submit something in writing um and or whether they want to you mm -hmm. know have a resolution or a com more conversation so i would i'm anticipating then that as this month unfolds that i'll have a better sense of what more what time we need to really gather people's comments and and i'm encouraging definitely uh like Councillor Herlich did to share it on social media. And I made that same comment to um, to staff at the lower tiers as well to uh, if you have social media accounts, um, you can put it out on there as well. Because people are calling people are interested, but that's not necessarily giving us the feedback that we want to have and we want to see. So um, we definitely want to share that opportunity and 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 if people want to put something in writing and they're not interested in, in using the internet in order to share their comments, um, then they can, they can give us a call and I, we can transcribe it or we can receive something in the mail for sure. So at least the month of October um, is a pretty secure window for people to get back in touch with us, give us their comments and feedback. Um, and then based on that, um, visit with each of the lower tiers will tell me whether I have the information now to move forward with one uh, of the council meetings, county council meetings in November. Okay, Bob. Uh, just a comment that uh, all of the calls I've received feel this is a positive step and are very pleased to see that uh, we are looking at uh, possible some small animals and for livestock and also uh, the possibility of saving bank burns. Very well received, Tom. Yeah, actually, I had most of my calls were dealing with, uh, if you drive around the countryside, you do notice there's a lot of little chicken coops <laughs> sprung up in backyards this, uh, since COVID-19 started. And I Todd just going like this, and I know you guys are dealing with it up there, but you aren't the only one dealing with it, Todd. It's all over the place. And it's not just the rural areas. It's in built-up areas, too. So... Uh, Anyway, uh, I thank you, Sally. Great report. And so is everybody happy here? We're going to leave this up for the public to comment for a month. She's going to approach all the lower tiers with this report. And then we'll deal with it in November. We'll get some feedback in November and possibly deal with it at a later meeting, but we'll get feedback in November. Does that work for everybody? No. That's the way it is. So I have a motion here. That comments regarding, we don't have anybody else in the public that wants to join us? But nobody's propped up at the last second? Okay, I have a motion here that comments regarding OPA number 189 are received for consideration. 
Moved by Darrell, second by Walter. Those in favor? That's carried. And I also have a motion here that the public meeting be adjourned at approximately 1020. Moved by you, second by Bob. Those in favor? Oh, first, questions or comments? Those in favor? Carried. Okay, we're gonna reconvene back into regular session. And if I can go back and find my other notes, we are at staff reports. And number one would be Todd, Community Emergency Management Coordinator, correct? Mm -hmm. Through the uh, Tyler? Through the order, there is a motion to reconvene. Oh, what? So regular council reconvene at oh, thank you. Motion that regular council reconvenes at approximately 10 20. Doug Callum, Daryl Herlick. Those in favor? Carried. Okay, now we have Todd McCone. As soon as we can get him on the screen here. So this is just housekeeping. He's just giving us a report. Anybody has any questions? You're willing, I'm more than willing to ask, but. There it is. There's Todd. Welcome, Todd. Hey. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, again, good morning, uh, Warden Aitchison and members of council. Um, I, I did submit a report. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you all received. Um, if it pleases council, I'd like to just uh, take two minutes and summarize that report, if that's all okay with you, Your Worship. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm gonna start with the background information. On January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a public health emergency uh, internationally. And on March 11th, as we're all aware, declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. On March 13th, your CMC activated the municipal emergency control groups within Perth County. And an interesting note prior to that date, on March 10th, Planning had already began with emergency management, police, fire, and EMS with a meeting called by myself. The COVID emergency response and emergency control group operations. I'm active, actively participating in joint countywide uh, emergency control group teleconferences and with all the member municipalities as well as the town of St. Mary's emergency control group meetings. At these meetings, I act as an advisor uh, to these groups and help them navigate through their COVID response. Additionally, I'm in contact with all of my alternate CMCs in Perth County, neighboring CMCs, and the Provincial uh, Operations Center regularly. I'm happy to report that all municipalities, emergency control groups are, are functioning extremely well. Our COVID response recovery guide. Staff work to create a comprehensive recovery guide for the use of the county and our local municipalities as we entered the recovery phase. This guide provided the framework for municipalities reopening and establish and get things back to a pre-emergency condition. The guide focused on three main areas, human needs, economic recovery, and corporate operations. COVID recovery readiness framework. Staff contributed to the creation of a recovery ready readiness framework that guided the county's reopening of its public buildings, namely the courthouse, Stratford Perth archives, and one Ontario. Priority areas for reopening were identified and risks associated with COVID were mitigated to what we see today in the operations of those buildings. Seasonal emergency preparedness. While COVID remains and continues to be a serious threat to everyone in Perth County and our local members, we still need prepared for all emergencies. I know I bring this up at all our emergency control groups and uh, I know I sound like a broken record, but we have to be prepared for everything, tornadoes, uh, snow, whatever may get thrown our way. A guide to emergency shelter reception operations was generated with the assistance of Canadian Red Cross and HPPH to address this concern. And I distributed that to all my local municipalities. Business continuity planning. In accordance with the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act 1990, the emergency management program is comprised of core pillars emergency plans, training for staff, and public education. As we move through to, uh, 2020 and into 2021, alternate means of achieving these cores 
uh, items are being reviewed through my emergency management business continuity plan. The public, the public education component of the emergency management program will be altered to include electronic delivery to uh, school classrooms. A joint video project is currently underway with all of our local fire departments, and we're going to bring that into the schools, hopefully at the end of the year, start of next year. The training component is moving forward as well, I'm happy to report. I'm speaking with OFM uh, Field officer, officer, Teresa Elzon, to deliver a basic emergency management course that was originally scheduled, scheduled for June of this year, held in Perth East. For later this year, or early next year, depending on where we stand with our COVID crisis. This course will be delivered online format. I'm also looking at another scribe course that was received very well, and it will be delivered in the same manner. Other projects, Your Worship, I'm working on uh, is our long-term care home COVID response planning. Uh, we're trying to get uh, plans in place should an outbreak um, hit our most vulnerable citizens. And I'm working with a large group and we're planning a tabletop to test our, uh, our uh, progress. I continue CEM services with the town of St. Mary's. I'm working on more protocols for evacuation center operations as we move into winter times and storms. Ongoing reporting and meetings with provincial emergency operations centers is important. I'm also working on debriefing for all our member municipalities and the county as well. I'm proud to say that the 220 compliance, uh, 2020 compliance report to the OFM EM have been filed for all municipalities. We were the first to do this, to achieve that recognition from the province for this current year. The reason I was able to submit that already is because we were in a de uh, declared state of emergency and, uh, and our operations uh, allowed us to file at that time. Financial implications of my report. This is a report for information only. There is no financial implications. Connection to our strategic plan. My target goals, goal two, regionalization and service effectiveness. Goal three, customer service excellent. And finally, goal five, corporate sustainability. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. If anybody has any questions for me, I can answer them at this time. Questions for Todd McCone. Todd uh, Kazenberg. <laughs> it's the battle of the Todds. <laughs> um, uh, Todd, I just want to express a great deal of appreciation for all the work that you do. Um, we certainly are very aware of your presence uh, and your support in North Perth, and uh, you've done just an outstanding job as relatively new to the job. And, uh, um, you know, certainly um, I, we can barely keep up with your pace in terms of how effective you've been. So um, you can add that to your performance review for the year that you can just clip out this part of the video and show it to your manager, but uh, outstanding work and we sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Uh, any other comments or questions, Daryl? Yeah, no, Todd, great. I, before I was in council, I, I wasn't aware of the work that goes into this by what you're running there. And it always concerns me as we are all aware of the aging population we have and the health outbreaks and the, the vulnerability to our elderly. And there's such a glut of them. It's going to be unique what we strum up to you know, just so that they can be at ease or if an outbreak happens within these homes, the response, it's going to be new and unique as we go forward for the next 20, 30 years. There's Absolutely. such an aging glut and that's something we always got to keep in our back pocket and be aware of that as much as it may seem new, it is, but it's to be expected. We're going to have new issues within our elderly and we're going to see it because there's such a glut so yeah and that's something we need to bring forward to the public too to let them aware that this is going to happen and the potentials are huge so no thank you yeah. yes, uh, just uh, through the warden i just want to um also um extend appreciation to todd because one of the things that you know, as we move into a pandemic, and, and I've been a former CEMC myself, so, you know, when you're looking at that role and, and coming to the county, uh, these documents did not exist previously. So while this is a, an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in terms of a pandemic and all across um, our jurisdiction that uh, we do have Todd assisting, 
I can, I can tell you the benefit of the documentation side so that um, we do have a better understanding on how we would respond, certainly in a second wave or if it goes further. So just, uh, great work. And um, I know Rachel's been working and supporting Todd as well. The documentation that generally council doesn't see is huge uh, to support a program like that and to support the lower tiers who have never been through a pandemic before as well. And um, great opportunity to show how that documentation moves into uh, supporting that type of emergency. Because I know in our initial discussions with the emergency management plans across the jurisdiction, um, our discussions were, well, that it doesn't apply because it's in a pandemic, but it was an opportunity to be able to show, yes, it does apply and this is how it applies. We didn't have the documentation before to show you how to apply it, but we do now. So it's a great way to build the program out uh, for those who come after us and to support, support people we serve. Great work. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you for all your hard work, Todd. Uh, on a lighter side, Walter has a question. He wants to know why you have two helmets there. He wants to know oh. if you're a double hatter. <laughs> <laughs> Walter, Walter um, uh, Mayor McKenzie should know the answer to that question. I, I served on uh, his fire department for many years <laughs> and, and as well as uh, Councillor Agates. Um, um, those are my, my part of my collection from my 25 years in the uh, fire service. Um, I'd just like to add, um, I'd like to take all the credit for everything that's happened uh, in Perth County with response to the COVID, but it's like I said in my report, our emergency control groups are functioning extremely well. Uh, it's a great group of people from the mayors to the CAOs to the directors of all the departments. Um, they, they all deserve a pat in the back. I, I just get to be part of it. So thank you for your recognition. I appreciate it. Well, and I just have one other little point. Uh, seasonal emergency preparedness. I know I talked to John McClellan, geez, six weeks ago, two months ago, and I asked if we had a plan coming up for the winter. When COVID started in the spring, we were out of the winter seasonal maintenance. And I said, you know, we got some sort of contingency plan in case we get into another wave going into the coming winter. And this isn't like a tornado where it may take out issues in Perth North and sections. This could take out employees in all four lower tiers at the same time, or the county, or a combination thereof. So that I know they are working on that. John may address that later on. And Todd's involved in that as well. Uh, yes, your version. The fallback plan, just in case we do run into issues with COVID as far as winter maintenance. Absolutely, Your Worship. Great, great question. Uh, I can assure you that we are. Uh, next meeting is October 8th. I'm not going to talk too much on it because that is John's area. I am part of the organization. Um, we will have plans in place. Uh, I can let John expand on that. I am part of that, uh, that team. And, uh, you know, I always say to my, uh, to my CAO, uh, you can't win a ball game with one pitcher. So we will have uh, plan B and C uh, in place. Um, you're, you're correct, it is a concern, but I feel quite confident that we can address that. Um, we have time and, and we have the uh, professional people involved to, to mitigate that, that situation. And for, and for the, you know, the mayors here, that discussion also includes the lower tier uh, heads of uh, public works as well. Correct. Just the county led thing. It's all five entities are working on it together. That's correct. Okay. I have a motion here. Perth County Council receives the Community Emergency Management Coordinator Activity Update Report for information. Rhonda, Bob, those in favor? Carrie, thank you, Todd. <coughs> Moving on. Now into planning services. And Bob, this is the one you've declared the conflict on. So we need to get uh, our planning man up there, David or Sally. Oh, there's David coming up. I think yeah, there's David. Okay. So we uh, now will do the uh, application for the official plan amendment. Is Monteith Ritzma gonna be on today? 
They were the agent on that. They're not showing up. Doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, David, you're leading this. Hey, thank you, uh, Warden Aitchison. Uh, Warden, members of uh, County Council, uh, the applicants on behalf of the owners of the subject property are seeking to amend the County of Perth official plan, uh, official plan amendment number 187, uh, for the purpose of allowing severance of a farm dwelling made surplus to the needs of a consolidated farm operation, which is located outside of the boundaries of the County of Perth. The criteria for severance of surplus farm dwellings in the official plan does require that the dwelling be surplus to a farm operation located within the county boundaries. The subject property in this case is irregular in shape and has an area of approximately 16 hectares or 40 acres with frontage along both Line 2 and Perth Road 139 in the township of Perth South. The subject property is a corner lot that currently contains a single detached dwelling with an attached garage, as well as a swimming pool, farmland, and a water course in the form of a municipal drain. The applicants have provided in their justification materials that the subject property has been consolidated with farm holdings located in neighboring Middlesex County, more specifically being the township of Lucan Bedolf. The driving distance between the subject farm and the designated home farm belonging to the consolidated farm operation in Middlesex County is approximately nine kilometers. The subject property is located approximately 1.5 kilometers from the municipal boundary between the County of Perth and Middlesex County. The distance between the subject farm and the home farm are comparable to the multiple holdings of farm operations that would be contained wholly within the County of Perth. As such, the matter of distance between the subject property and its parent operations is not of con significant concern from a planning perspective or in considering the two properties as a consolidated farm operation. The, propo the proposed amendment has been found to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, provided that the area of land to be severed be limited to the minimum size needed uh, to accommodate the residential use and provide uh, sufficient room for appropriate sewage and water services. While the applicants have provided a severance sketch illustrating proposed boundaries for the severed lot, these boundaries would be confirmed through a future consent application should the official plan amendment being proposed today be approved. A draft amendment has been provided which is consistent with the application as found on Schedule F to our report. The County of Perth has not received any correspondence from members of the public in response to the circulation and notice that were issued on August 12, 2020 in regard to this application. At its meeting on September 1, 2020, the Council of the Township of Perth South provided recommendation that the Council of the County of Perth approve official plan amendment number 187 and with a copy of this recommendation included on page 107 of the agenda under Schedule E to our report. In summary, the Planning Office recommends that uh, County of Perth Council receive our report concerning official plan amendment number 187, that the respective bylaw be presented for approval, and that County Council approve the application for official plan amendment made by Monteith Ritzma Phillips Professional Corporation on behalf of Johannes Blumen and Hendrika Blumen Holst for property described as part of Lot 25, the East Mitchell Road concession being part one on plan 44R504, Blanchard Ward, Township of Perth South with municipal address of 4832, line two. Uh, that is the summary of our report and recommendation to council. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, warden or members of council have uh, regarding the application. Thank you. Thanks, David. Todd? Well, I take note of the size of the uh, the parcel that is proposed for uh, severance, and it is uh, uh, quite remarkably large. Not that um, I inherently don't believe, as we've just talked through the OPA, that we need to look at each of these uh, um, with a degree of uh, uniqueness. But um, you know, when I look at this particular parcel, um, 
you you can see where there are lines of trees. I know nothing about those trees. Uh, I know how I do not know how mature they are. Um, but if that's the basis for setting uh, a lot line, I would say that um, that that are some of our historical uh, choices with regards to this might need to uh, to uh, be born or weighed in on on this particular application. Uh, it does seem like a large parcel at three point five acres. Okay, uh, your comments are noted there, Todd, but we're actually not dealing with severance today. We're only dealing with the official plan amendment. The size of that property will be dealt with when uh, it comes to First South Council for severance, but it can't come to First South Council until we approve the official plan amendment. And my comment's going to be when we started the official plan public meeting with Sally there, one of the first things we talked about is exactly this right here somebody who lives in a different municipality and wants to serve our house. So if we change that, then that'll eliminate these official plan amendments. Anyway, does anybody else have any comments or questions for David? I don't see any. Uh, I've got a motion here, County, oh, and just so you know, Walter sat on that public meeting at Perth South with me, as Bob had a conflict, so that's why you'll see Walter and myself as part of the public meeting. The County Council received the application for County Official Plan Amendment by Monteith Ritzman Fellow Professional Corporation on behalf of Johan Bloman and Henrika Bloman Hulst, OPA 187, for information and that the respective bylaw be presented for approval. That County Council approve the application for Official Plan Amendment by Monteith Ritzman Phillips Professional Corporation on behalf of Johans Bloman and Hendrika Bloman Hulst. OPA 187 for the property described as part lot 26, 25, excuse me, East Mitchell Road concession being part one on 44R-504 Blanchard Ward Township of Perth South. Moved by you, second by Matt Duncan. Comments or questions? Those in favor, she's carried. Thank you, David. Thank you, Council. If I may just uh, bring this up, everyone probably noticed that there was two. There was already a severance off of this lot, and I did make inquiries about that, how that happened. And years ago, there was never a condition put on that they could not sever another lot, and that's maybe something that we could look at. We've seen that one other time. I think it was in person the last time too, and I asked that question then how that happened. And I, I can point out more of those in Perth East than you yeah. can in Perth South. Well, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's others around the municipal. All house, kinds so of them. I guess maybe when we do our new official plan, maybe that's something that we should look at if we're going to <coughs> allow things that happened 30, 40 years ago to keep happening, or we're going to bring everybody to date and and from now on you can only sever off one. That's so actually that's, that's actually looked after when you do your zoning yeah. amendment change after the service is done. Well, which Sally, prohibits additional buildings. Right, and I asked Sally about that, and she said a policy could possibly be made in our new official plan. I'm just saying that that's something that I think we have to look at sometime. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying we don't, no. but it is being looked at temporarily yeah. with that zoning change. Condition of it's, and it's usually part of the condition of severance as well. Uh, land division. Well, moving forward, it is, but 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't. Well, we, that's can't, how we can't change seven, what happened 30 years ago. 72. I, well, we can't <laughs> if we change our policy going forward when we change our official plan policy that perhaps we can put it in there then that moving forward that you cannot sever off again if there's already one severance. We, we can change it if we want to. So you would eliminate severing the surplus farmhouse if there was already one done? Right. At any time. Yeah. In history. Yeah. Okay. Just get the clarification, that's all. Yeah. No, that's... Okay. Where are we going to move on? We're not going to take a break. We can stand up and stretch when we get to the closed session because that takes a few minutes to set up. But we're going to bomb through this because it's not like you're going to walk around here anyway. Okay. County... Uh, next I have Justin, I believe, right? Yes, economic development and tourism response to COVID-19. Justin. Uh, thank you, Warren Aitchison, members of council. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're good, Justin. 
Excellent, thank you. So, uh, morning, well, morning to the members of council. The intent of my report this morning is to provide council with an update on the activities of the Economic Development and Tourism Department over the summer months as part of our ongoing pivot to assist businesses during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll provide a little bit of an update on some of our activities over the summer months, as well as provide a bit of a progress report on our TIO uh, Rural Regional Relief and Recovery Fund activities that we received that uh, grant from the Tourism Industry of Association of Ontario to to uh, provide. So I'll provide a little bit of an update on our activities as well as uh, a little bit of progress report on our TIO activities. So uh, there are a number of activities. I won't go through the report in detail you have it in front of you. Uh, a number of activities that council will be familiar with that we've uh, engaged even kind of since the last uh, council report. Uh, we continue to wrap up our How To From Home series, uh, our COVID Focus Opportunities newsletter continues to go out, as well as provide ongoing support to businesses as new programs, new resources are, are announced by the province and uh, local organizations. Uh, the one thing I would like to draw council's attention to is our podcast. So we have continued to publish the podcast on a weekly basis. Uh, the list of topics and speakers is listed there in the agenda. Uh, I would say that, make a quick note that uh, although there are 17 podcasts listed here and we were planning to wrap up with our 17th edition, uh, we actually will be extending for one more episode as we were able to secure uh, an inspector from the public health unit uh, to speak about some of the protocols that businesses are, are implementing to keep themselves and employees safe. We figured that was a very uh, both timely and important message that businesses were looking for information on. So. Uh, that will be our last and final episode of the podcast for this series, and then we'll take a bit of a, a pause to evaluate the program, assess some of the uh, the metrics on, on listenership, and decide whether we pursue uh, a second series or uh, as needed. Uh, another opportunity I think I'd like to draw council's attention to is our uh, a number of webinars and conferences that our department has been involved with over the summer months. Uh, probably the most one you'd be most well aware of is the teeny tiny summit where Perth County uh, Economic Development Tourism Officer Sarah Franklin uh, was involved in giving a presentation on uh, the department's pivot activities to, to deal with COVID-19. Uh, there's over 164 economic development professionals from across the province who were involved uh, registered to be a part of that session so uh, it was really a great opportunity for us to share the work that we're doing, share Perth County's message more broadly uh, we've also been involved in a number of other podcasts, including uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, some uh, newcomer youth uh, podcasts with the library, as well as uh, last week, our, our tourism officer was involved with the Merge Media podcast sharing, uh, promoting rural tourism uh, during a pandemic. So that was another great opportunity that we had to, to share the message of Perth County uh, further afield. Uh, I'd like to also draw council's attention to, uh, to the RTO for digital marketing campaign that we've been involved in. Uh, this was the result of a grant that we were successfully applied for to conduct a, a digital marketing campaign, uh, both focused on, on staycation, so keeping people local, but uh, a bit unique in, in the sense because we were, through this funding that we received, we were able to push our message out into uh, neighboring areas, so to urban centers, uh, GTA area, London. Uh, so get that message out about uh, visiting Perth County to a bit of a, a market we haven't really had that much uh, penetration of so far. So uh, I did list some of the metrics there in the report. Uh, it's quite staggering. Actually, we're really thrilled with the amount of engagement this, uh, this campaign has received in, in a short amount of time. Uh, so as mentioned, the report, the campaign had over 328,000 uh, impressions over social media uh, since it was launched in August and over 130,000 engagements. So that uh, is those are incredible numbers that we're uh, really thrilled with. Uh, as well, I mentioned the report that our Discover Perth County video has seen an average of uh, just over 3,600 uh, views per day throughout this campaign. So uh, we're really, really thrilled with this campaign. And it also, I think, helps us, uh, you know, through the grant, we're able to kind of test this campaign out. And we're obviously seeing that it's, it's been very successful. So uh, we're really pleased with that. Uh, I'd like to also draw Council's attention to our participation in the University of Guelph Impact of COVID-19 survey, which is uh, currently available. I know I've, I've been working with the survey uh, lead, which is uh, Lee Deacon, a professor at the University of Guelph, uh, promoting this through social media, reaching out to the lower tiers to continue to promote this. Uh, most recently, a report I received was that our, our numbers are good, but we, I think we're still not exactly where we want it to be. So we're going to be investigating some new uh, tactics to get the survey into the hands of, of our residents, because it really will uh, you know, provide a great opportunity to provide information about how COVID is impacting 
businesses, residents, uh, not only from an economic standpoint, but also from that social uh, and other components as well. So uh, really encourage you to uh, continue to promote the survey to your, to your residents and, and staff. Uh, and finally, I'll just uh, share a bit of a progress report on our, our activities to date through the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario Regional Relief and Recovery Fund that we received over $153,000 to implement projects across uh, three different phases, the hyperlocal, welcoming neighboring communities, and then the Great Ontario Bucket List. So uh, to date, we've executed most of our first phase projects, so those hyperlocal projects. Uh, we did distribute our tourism recovery kits. We had uh, over 90 businesses uptake on, on that program. Uh, receive PPE and other forms of, of uh, you know, signage and, and uh, supplies to help them reopen and stay open safely. Our uh, traveling deal wheel, which you might have seen on social media, has been ex extremely well received. Uh, we had 10 businesses who hosted this, this promotional activity, uh, this wheel, and an additional 23 businesses that were supported through a uh, combination of uh, you know, goods and, and providing gift cards that we purchased through this funding. So uh, we're able to, you know, stretch these dollars and, and impact as many businesses as possible. Uh, received a lot of social media engagement. Businesses were, were posting that the wheel was coming to their business uh, and then reporting on, uh, on the you know, this in increased traffic and the people who were really thrilled to see this, this fun way to engage uh, during this time, which you know obviously is not, uh, not ideal for any of us. So uh, a really great promotion. Uh, and then finally, through that uh, hyperlocal, we also have a number of travel writers who come to Perth County uh, for day trips and I provided some links in the report to some of their documented blog posts for, for your uh, information. Uh, so some of the more regional activities will be rolling out uh, through this month and, and next. Uh, one of those is our article through NARS City which is an editorial magazine based out of Toronto focuses on uh, bringing uh, urban residents out to uh, areas of, of uh, the province they may not otherwise know about uh, so I believe that article will be published this week in our city, so you can find that online. Uh, as well, we are thrilled that our expanded farm gate program will be rolling out over the coming weeks. We just have now uh, received all that, uh, the signage and various uh, equipment and, and uh, uh, items that we need to roll that program. So we'll be getting that out in the next couple of weeks uh, now that we have that all, all here on site. And then finally, just to uh, wrap up uh, our great Ontario bucket list promotion. So, uh, we've got a number of different components to this uh, this uh, kind of final phase of our, our TAIO funding. Uh, we submitted a number of itineraries to the Culinary Tourism Alliance. So those were opportunities to provide uh, day trips and overnight stays, which will be part of a digital passport available to, to uh, residents across the province of Ontario to tap into our local businesses, local activities. Uh, so we submitted, as I said, a number of itineraries for that as well. Uh, we're hoping that our itinerary may be featured in the uh, upcoming Globe and Mail uh, focus on tourism on October 16. So we submitted our, uh, our itineraries to potentially be included in that publication as well. Uh, just another quick note, uh, not mentioned in the report, but since then we've uh, applied to become a World Safe Travel Stamp Certified Destination in Perth County, as well as we're rolling the certification into our businesses. We know that uh, you know, obviously with concerns around COVID and just going forward, people are going to be looking for those certain kinds of certification before they consider uh, traveling anywhere. So we want to be ahead of the curve on that, uh, that certification. And uh, finally, one last thing in note to our, our CAIO funding projects. I know when we originally presented uh, back after we received the funding, we had talked about a, a movie and market night as being one of the uh, activities that we were, we were going to be uh, proposing. Uh, since then, we've had a number of conversations with, with our, uh, our member municipalities and local community groups and businesses, and I decided to pull back on that activity. It just didn't seem like a, a very prudent move with, uh, you know, hosting a community event. So we're going to refocus that funding towards uh, some enhanced holiday promotions uh, for the, uh, the, the winter months, which we know are going to be especially difficult for our businesses. So uh, I just wanted to provide council with that update on our, our pivot activities, a bit of a progress report on our TIO activities, and... Uh, just uh, have an opportunity for any questions that Justin might have. Thanks, Justin. Questions for Justin? Don't see any questions here whatsoever, uh, Justin. So that means your department must be doing a great job. I just do want to also point one thing out to council that that department has been extremely busy, as you're aware. But also, 
Justin mentioned some of the things they've been involved in. And Sarah Franklin actually did a presentation in AMO. I'm, I know uh, Todd Kasselberg attended AMO. I'm not sure if you saw Sarah's presentation. I thought it was extremely well done. And I think it's actually something all council should get a chance to see at some point in time. But it was a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, presentation she made at AMO. Uh, so there's no questions. I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the 2021 County Council meeting schedule. Oh, wrong one. We're ahead of myself. Where'd that one go? I need the one for, uh, here we go. The Perth County Council receives the economic development and tourism response to COVID-19 pandemic pivot update number three, report for information moved by Bob, second by you, those in favor. Gary, carrying on. Did you want to take a quick break if somebody wants to go to the washroom? I'm taking a break. Okay. <laughs> the rest of you good? Oh, we're not going to be that long here. We're getting close. We'll be having a break in about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, we'll let's break before before close. Close. So We're going to break right before close. If we keep moving, we're going to get there right shortly. Okay. Uh, we are moving on. Carpet services. And that is the report uh, for Tyler. Perfect. Thanks to the board. So the following report highlights the 2021 proposed meeting schedule for regular uh, county council meetings. The proposed schedule has been prepared in consultation with the county first procedure bylaw. Uh, so there's just a couple of things I want to draw to council's attention. Uh, first would actually be July 1st. So July 1st is Canada Day. It falls on Thursday. So it's been proposed that we move that to the second. So that's the move to the Friday right after Canada Day. So I wanted to make sure that uh, council was aware of that. Um, and then other than that, uh, there was, depending on how conferences work out in 2021, is the Austin. So OSUM, Ontario Small Urban Municipalities. Uh, may have a conflict with that in May. It's just a, a suggestion. Okay, Rhonda. Do you think instead of having it Friday, July 2nd, we could have it Wednesday, June 30th? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that would be better because yeah. some people go away for the long weekend and some people will take that Friday to go. So I'm just wondering if we could just back it up the other direction if that would be possible instead of the like, oh, second. Up, Bob? I'd actually thought moving it the other way to the eighth. Oh well, I'm good with that uh, too. Because we only have one meeting in July anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we okay. move it towards the middle of the month, then to the eighth. Either way. Okay, I'm gonna give you a straw poll chance. <laughs> May 31st or uh, June 30th. July 8th. July. Looks like July 8th's the winner. We'll make sure that's in the resolution. Okay, so. I have a couple other comments yep. if I may too. Um, just, I can't remember why we only went with one meeting in September. <laughs> why did we do that? So through the warden, uh, we went with that because the last couple Septembers have been very, very good weather. And okay. um, it was the last two Septembers have been very hot weather as well. So the idea was we would uh, set it up as a one meeting, uh, include that with the June, July, August, and then at any time, of course, during the year, if you decide that you need a second meeting in September or even June or July or at any point, you can always add that additional meeting. Okay. No, I just that's why I couldn't remember the rationale why we did that. Fall harvest was another thing. Yeah, that was, was one of the discussions, effortless. and I'll be honest with you, that worked great for me. Oh yeah, yeah. It was effortless. I know we were we were quite busy in September. And again, and I guess the other are we allowing enough days for budget? Um, like last year, we actually did budget six different council meetings, and the schedule we. We've got two for sure, another maybe, and probably one, maybe two in December. As long as we have enough enough meetings to do the budget, I guess that's my only concern. Like sometimes we de we designate an actual day and it's budget only, and I think that's what you've done on January fourteenth and February fourth. Is that correct? It's it will only be budget, or there'll yes. be yep. only budget. Only, only budget. budget. Okay. Just that we have enough days to do it. Like 
I, I, I'm thinking we should be okay. Okay. Uh, but turns out that it's not, and we may have to add one. Yeah, but the staff's working on budget now, and I know the one thing we've talked about is lean and mean. Well, here, Darrell, the lower levels are going to be needing extra time. I know that already. My head just naturally runs numbers. <laughs> We're going to be short on revenue. We have big decisions. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I know what I know. There's, uh, I think, what's the word we use? It's not what you would like, it's what we have to have. What was it? That's, that's not the it's word. Not sort through the word, and it was not, not what you want, it's what you need. Yeah, that's a better phrase. That discussion's already been had, just so you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, just there's no sense going into it fluff. We're we know it's going to be a tough budget session, so let's start out on the tougher side versus going backwards. Okay, is anybody okay with that change? So I have a motion here that Perth County receives the 2021 County Council meeting schedule report for information, and I'm going to say that County Council approves the 2021. Council meeting schedule as changed for the July meeting to July the 8th. Yep. Bob. Uh, I'll, I'll move that, uh, but I also want to comment that further to your comment about being lean. Every year we go through budget and then we go back and we say, well, where can we cut? Let's cut before we start. Well, that's what we're, we're trying to work on. We're doing, time. we're doing staff. Well, I'll let Laura explain that a little bit. Thank you. So through the warden, um, uh, generally the budget program that um, uh, at least myself prior to coming here, and I know the staff are doing this this year, we look at the budgets, we go through every business line, we are having our staffing meetings with HR, with each manager uh, to make sure that do they have the staffing they need, do they have the right kind of staffing do they need, and if they don't, um, what needs to come forward. And I can tell you one of those discussions where we sat down with the manager, and I know these, these types of discussions hadn't happened in the past, when we're looking at staff in particular, is um, you know one of the divisions that has three employees, but they're going down to two. So um, just in terms, because it's gonna change what they require to do the work that they need to do and uh, really good logic. So. The other thing that staff are doing is going through their um, agreement to make sure that if there is anything in the agreement that we can change, the one example I'll give you is the shredded contract. We did change the frequency. Now, um, you know, we, no impact to us in terms of being able to do our work and making sure that confidential information is properly disposed of, but it saves about $1,200 a year. That's a very small amount but it's, it's something that we should be looking at right up front in our budget review to pull efficiencies out and to be able to report those efficiencies to council to say, we started the budget, this is what we've already removed from the budget and what we present to you is what we believe we need in order to make um, next, next year work. So a lot of attention. Anybody got any comments on budget? The other thing is when we go through, Todd? <laughs> I'm looking around the room. I haven't got up there yet. Maybe, maybe I have to do my chicken wave again to uh, to secure uh, to, to secure attention here. I don't know, or a chicken dance. I could do that as well if you like. Um, in uh, just as an observation, uh, in certainly in North Perth, we have a, a, a dedicated meeting that we call the visioning session, and at mm -hmm. that session, we bring forward uh, the opportunities and ideas that that councillors have and consider public input that's been made with regards to uh, our budget planning. And uh, I guess I, I'm I'm commending this idea to you. I think it works really well. And you know, one of the things that that we seriously have to think about is what things can we stop doing? And I think uh, Councillor Wilhelm was sort of making that point that, um, you know, we need to sort of bring forward earlier rather than later um, 
places where we believe we need to make a change in in terms of eliminating or changing up the service but we have to be creatively destructive these days to be blunt and um and reconsider all of the operations of of all of our governments and and so um i'm going to commend to you the idea of a visioning session because it allows councillors to to speak to the things that they believe should be the priorities and to to sort of allocate um, uh, suggestions uh, for possible changes as well that that um, could save money and um, and I'm not sure why we sort of begin with this the current state as as our our movement place like where we move from when in fact uh, some councillors around this table may have ideas about things that the county could drop or that the county should get into that they've never been into before so um, please give that some consideration yeah it's good comments uh, i know we have had the staff did have a visioning session last week it's true the warden the senior management met last week in order to have a, a discussion about um, the, the um, courthouse campus, the properties that we have there, and the future of where the administration would reside to line up with the council meeting on October 29th and, and preparation for that to say how much space do we actually need and what's the most efficient uh, options that we can put, efficient and cost effective options that we can put in front of council for their information. We have to confirm the space that we need. So that, that's, that, is, um, that was a workshop on a very specific topic, but it will have uh, a big impact in terms of making sure that council has the information they need to make an informed decision on big money ticket items that will cost in the future as well. But happy to bring a visioning session. Rhonda? Yeah, just to further comment what Todd does, Perthes does that as well. We have a visioning session in, in July. And then that's the time that if we have items in that people brought to our attention that we need to bring in the budget or where we hope the budget's going to come in at or, you know, if we're willing to add more services or tighten the belt or that's where the ideas all come out and then staff takes that and, and comes back with reports and it mm -hmm. seems to work very well. So I concur with what Todd is, is saying. Okay. I know in Perth South, we've already got it out on social media for the ratepayers of Perth South to make their comments, what they think is the most important, what they think is maybe the least important. Yeah. Anything they'd like to see changed, and we're actually looking for the ratepayers' input on that yeah, as well. We do as well, I believe, in Perth East. Today. We've run ours out already. It's been out about two weeks. Yeah. yeah, we do. I think my comment to a lot of the senior staff, and I've been in, and I haven't been in that much because of COVID, but and maybe you want to all shoot me when I say this, but I said, we have to have next to no increase. You can't expect business to, to rally around and come out of COVID with a big tax increase. It, you just can't do it. You've got to keep the tax increases as low as possible. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of them still in trouble. Mm -hmm. And if it locks down even further, there'll be bigger trouble. Anyway, uh, I do have a mover on that motion with the change for the date of July the 8th. Do I have a second, Doug Cohn? Those in favor? Thank you. And we will pursue that, Todd, about the visioning and whatnot. Okay, moving on. Tree inspection report. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you. Through the warden. So this is the uh, tree inspection report prepared by Mark Smith. Uh, it indicates that there are three inspections. If you have questions, concerns, inquiries, please let me know, and I'm happy to pour those on. Anybody have any questions on the report? Yes. Last chance, don't see any hands. I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the August 2020 tree inspectors report for information. Moved by Walter, second by Daryl. Those in favor? Carried. Okay, John McClellan. <clears throat> We got Johnny coming on. Everybody wants to come about now. Everybody wants to come about now. 
Can, can people at least hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear you. Maybe that's good too. Just kidding, John. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. We're good. Carry on. Thank you, Ward Nacherson. Good morning, Council. Uh, if it pleases the Ward and Council, I'll maybe address uh, Councillor Duncan's comments and uh, 5.12 and 5.13 of the consent agenda. Uh, just so council is aware, I have met with Wellington County staff and Perth and Wellington OPP regarding Perth Road 140 and Perth Line 91, which is also Wellington 8 and 9. Just so you're aware, Wellington County still has the roundabout at that intersection budgeted for 2025. We are having another look at this intersection, updating reviewing accident data and preparing warrant analysis uh, for alternative intersection controls. The warrant process is outlined in the Ontario Traffic Manual and it has a collision component to it. And that states that a high ac accident frequency is an average of four collisions per year over a three year period. And that just considers collisions such as right angles and turning movements. And I'm not sure if there's any, I'm aware of any intersection in the county that would actually meet that warrant threshold for accident frequency. And that's fairly consistent with what we're seeing when the MTO has reviewed intersections such, such as Russelldale and Bornholm. And I know today Councillor Agates will be bringing up uh, recent accidents at Perth Road 135 and line 44 under new business today. So accidents and intersection safety seem to be an increasing issue all over the county and not just specific to Perth Road 140 and Perth line 91. And while I need to report back to council on that particular matter, uh, my thoughts are that the reports should maybe include a more fulsome or countywide review and perhaps with a more holistic approach it would not probably surprise you that a very high percentage of motor vehicle accidents are a result of driver error. And even if that driver is charged and found guilty, because of joint and several liability, that does not absolve the municipality or eliminate liability of claims stemming from the accident. And many times this leaves us with the question, what more can we do? And that's led to me researching Vision Zero which is a global movement dedicated to the reduction and elimination of traffic deaths and injuries. Central to Vision Zero is the shared responsibility between road users, designers, and maintainers of the transportation system. The approach puts aside driver fault and acknowledges human fallibility and the need to provide greater allowances for human error. About a half a dozen larger municipalities in Ontario have adopted Vision Zero plans. And if council wishes, I could provide in a report what this might look like for a smaller, more rural municipality. Comments on John's last comment? Bob? I would uh, be interested, uh, as John mentioned, the accident frequency is increasing and we're seeing more fatalities and uh, anything we can do to uh, see how to prevent those accidents, I'd be in favor of it. Anybody else got comments? Daryl? Yeah, again, yeah, let, let's see what you got, John. I mean, it's an issue. I will state though, we, we do find in ourselves spending money in intersections and accidents still come Flanagan Corners. We cut those hills out. Lo and behold, I believe there was an accident there. So it's still happening. We are spending money, we're doing what we can and the accidents are still happening. But if there's something you got here, I I have, 
it's it's a tough one. People aren't paying attention. They're distracted. The automation in cars, phones, it's tough. Let's see what we can do, though. Matt? John, did you say that this program removes driver error from the from the study? Uh, through you, Ward Natchison, no, it doesn't remove driver error. Driver error all, will always be there. Councillor Duncan, um, I think it just acknowledges the fact that uh, that will always be the case. Um, and it's the responsibility of, of everybody involved in our transportation network. And um, so it just what it's basically saying is, yes, humans will err and we need to make better accommodation with our designs, with our education, with our enforcement in order to sort of achieve a, a reduced or even eliminate uh, fatalities and or serious accidents. Okay, anybody else? So I guess if you maybe want to take a look at bringing back something on that, John, at some point in time here. Okay, we're gonna move on to the Gallenstown speed limit. Thank you, Warden. Uh, this report is to address a request from the municipality of North Perth to reduce the speed limit in the village of Gowanstown. Gowanstown is located on Highway 23, north of Listowel, where Perth Line 88 intersects to the west and Line 88, a township road to the east. Perth Line 88 has a speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour. There is no speed reduction in the 320 meter built up a section of Gallenstown on Perth Line 88. And generally, a speed reduction is not required since vehicles are either slowing down for the stop sign or accelerating as they turn off of Highway 23. However, this request is very similar to a 60 kilometer hour speed limit reduction in the village of Rannick that Council approved earlier this year. And to remain consistent with county speed zones, staff are recommending to post a 60 kilometer hour speed zone for 320 meters on Perth Line 88 through the built up section of Gowanstown. And that's indicated uh, by the blue line on the picture provided in the report. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for John or comments? Any of the North Perth councillors got any comments on that? Hmm. Not seeing any. Well, Matt. Uh, I can just say it was brought to it was brought by one of our councillors to to our meeting, and it was a request of the citizens in that area to have that speed limit lowered, especially when it's a, a fifty zone on the on the east side of of Highway Twenty Three there. But because it's controlled by the county, we had to bring it to county to have that looked after. I think it's a very reasonable request. Yes. Okay, I have a motion. Perth County Council receives the Gallenstown Speed Limit Perth Line 88 report for information Can, that Council approves the 60 kilometer speed zone on Perth Line 88 in the village of Gallenstown and further that Schedule B of Bylaw 2674 is amended to include the 320 meter long speed zone on Perth Line 88 in Gallenstown. Moved by Todd Kassenberg, second by Doug Kellum. Any comments or questions? Those in favor? She's carried. Okay, John. Uh, thank you, Warden Aitchison. Uh, the next report uh, deals with the Whalen Line update. Uh, staff has two directions on this matter. One being to continue discussions with Perth South and Middlesex County regarding the assumption of the Wayland Line from Wayland's Corners at Highway 23 to Perth Road 151, and that's mirroring the upload of Middlesex County. Two, being to investigate an asset swap with Perth South involving the remainder of the Wayland Line and Perth Road 151. And while we are working at those two directions in tandem, given timelines and certain aspects of each staff believe it is best to address this in, in two stages. Stage one is to mirror the upload of Middlesex County. Uh, the county already has a boundary agreement with Middlesex and both provide a similar level of service for a class three roadway. 
Additionally, to the west of us, Huron County is recommended to mirror the other portion of the Wayland, Mills, Wayland Line and Middlesex upload on behalf of South Huron. And we expect stage one can be completed by the upcoming winter season. Stage two is to continue the investigation of the asset swap for the remainder of the Wayland Line and Perth Road 151. Now, both stages and directions make a lot of sense on many levels. However, one of the more important aspects is to look at the assets involved in the swap. And staff have begun to work on that analysis. And while not complete, we know that the both assets are in very good condition. We acknowledge that there is some work to be completed within the next 10 years. However, those costs, along with the ongoing capital and maintenance costs, are relatively equal. This stage is slightly more complicated because it is still a boundary road between Perth South and Luke and Bidolf. They have an existing boundary agreement and provide an adequate and similar level of service on this section as it is a class four roadway. Staff recommend that this stage be part of the 2021 Public Works Business Plan. Uh, further to this, the CAO and I met with the county lawyer this week to discuss both stages. Through those discussions, staff would like council to consider an, an, some additional resolutions on this matter. And they are that Perth County Council directs staff to bring back resolutions and associated boundary agreements to upload a section of the Whalen line from Whalen's Corners to Perth Road 151 from the township of Perth South. And the council directs staff to include in the 2021 Public Works Business Plan the review, resolutions, and associated agreements to exchange assets between Perth South and the county, being the remainder of the Wayland Line and Perth Road 151. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for John. Comments for John. <coughs> Okay, John just uh, read a recommended resolution. Right. And I don't have that in front of me because oh. that was done after the lawyer's meeting. Right. So through the warden, what, what the resolution allows us to, because right now we're just we're just having discussions. So the resolution would allow us to proceed with the actual work that we need to do to take care of stage one and deal with Middlesex County. And, and that's logical that we would do that. I just want to make sure that we have have the proper resolution to support that activity and um and then the other piece would be stage two that uh we know that is something that we can go to middlesex county and say we have direction that this is something that we want to be working on and we want to see resolution of this as stage two in 2021 so it just gives a cl clarity in terms of what we're able to do in the direction we want to go well um i think uh, Comment, it makes good sense to uh, do that uh, based on the volume of traffic on those two roads. And I would certainly move. Okay, so I actually do have a copy of that resolution. Do you want me to read it? I will. The Perth County Council directs staff to bring back resolutions and associated boundary agreements to upload a section of the Whalen Line from Whalen's Corners to Perth Road 151 from the Township of Perth South and council directs staff to include in the 2021 public works business plan to the review resolutions and associated agreements to exchange assets between Perth South and the county being the remainder of the Whalen line and Perth road 151. Yeah, that's... Now we have to do that's a separate resolution. Can... Well, I can, we can add this resolution yeah. and add further that Perth County Council receives the report. September update report for the whale and line update. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to move that bus? Yes. Do I have a second? That would be you. Any further comments or questions? Those in favor? Carried. All right. Okay, next is. And Warden Aitchison. If you don't mind, I, I'd like to provide a verbal update on the winter modernization project. Perfect. As I've had people ask. Yes, I'm aware. <laughs> um, 
So the council is aware the Public Works Working Group has met recently to review some work that the consultant has done on plow road optimization. Uh, there were issues with this work, such as com computer modeling and parameters that impacted other areas of the project. Con consultants said they'd need to go back and revise a good portion of their analysis, and that would inevitably delay their final report deadline, which was originally scheduled for October 26. Now, the res consultant responded last Wednesday with the revised schedule, and the final report will now be delivered on November 19th. Our public works group is not pleased with the initial road optimization work or the delay in the final report. Uh, however, we are, we are uh, um, determined to get a, a good and a valuable report out of this. Uh, this has been made known to, the senior to a senior member of the consultant and they have ensured us that they will oversee and that the project would provide the deliverables that were stated within their proposal. Our public works working group has been updated and they have provided input on all matters. And I've also advised the clerk uh, to hold a spot on the November 19th council, county council meeting so that the consultant can present their final report. And I can answer any questions. Okay, questions? Bob. Uh, I believe that uh, there's a draft that has to go to the province on November 15th. And I'm a little concerned that the province is going to see this draft report before County Council does. Um, so I, needless to say, I'm not very pleased with that. John, any comment? I'm not sure about the dates myself. I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, um, the province does get a, um, an, an update or a it's a draft of the final report um, and that, yes, that is scheduled to them. I think it's either November 13th or 15th. The, so the uh, county uh, council can see that uh, before it goes to the province? And, and sorry, further to that, the province requires the final report uh, on or before December 4th. Wow. That's not a lot of turnaround time. Any chance council could see that before the 19th? Um, through you, Warden Aitchison, just given the revised schedule from the consultant, that would be highly unlikely. But they must be gonna have it done by the 15th if they're gonna submit it to the province. Correct. So not necessarily a council meeting, but could that be distributed to all the county councillors and whoever is all involved prior to the, going to the province so we could at least look at it? Through you, Warden Aitchison, um, I know the working group will see that draft report and we can, we can make it work so that uh, all councillors can see that. That's what I think the general consensus would be, Bob. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly like to see it uh, sometime, uh, at least a few days, if not a week or two before it goes to the province, because if County Council isn't pleased with it, why would we submit a report that uh, the province is going to say yay or nay on that they paid $100,000 for, and yet the county's not, uh, County Council's not uh, happy with it. So uh, I don't know, I, this is kind of between a rock and a hard place, but I think it's imperative that County Council review it before it goes to the province. Okay, so Walter? Well, I guess uh, I agree with what Bob has said, but uh, the key thing you got to keep in mind, it is a draft and uh, maybe the copy that goes to the province can be in three inch letters, draft copy, and, and even if it says the County Council hasn't seen it yet, but, you know, draft is a draft, and we can still make changes after that. My concern is more with the turnaround time from draft to final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be honest with you, I honestly still think if the working group is going to see that prior to it going to the province, and you mentioned, John, that it would be the case, and I see no reason why that can't get distributed to the council members. 
with the words draft. And remember when you get it, it's draft. Because some people can fuse draft with the real McCoy. Does that work for everybody here? Anybody opposed to that? Not seen any hands, Bob? Just a question. When, to John, when uh, are they expected to see this draft? If, uh, if you just allow me uh, to check on my emails here. Well, while you're checking, John, I just wanna, I just have two comments. Uh, quite some time ago, I commented on to you on how bad our signs look because we had used bolts on and they rusted and they ran down. I see that someone's cleaned up the signs and put new bolts on and congratulations. It certainly makes our signs look much better. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, by the looks of the schedule, we will be receiving that uh, draft report November 5th. Okay, so it's my understanding that we're in agreement here that when you receive that draft on the 5th of November and you forward it on to all your working partners, it will also be forwarded on to County Council. Perhaps. Does that work for everybody? that okay, John? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. And then we will have a few days to peruse through it. Rhonda? I have a Rhodes question. Can I do it now when John's here or do you want me to do it under new business? Uh, I know you're the one you wanna bring up. So John's here, so I'm gonna allow you to do that right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so yesterday there was a bad accident on uh, road 135 and line 44, which both our county roads and there's been several accidents there in the last few months um, and the neighbors are getting quite concerned of what's going on. We've already done some things I believe there. We've put flashing lights in. We, I think we have rumble strips. We have large signs and yet they still continue to go through this going east and west through the stop signs and causing a lot of problems. I'm just wondering with this, what we've talked about already, John, coming up with some studies. Is there anything else we can do at this corner to help eliminate this problem? Yesterday, the one car actually burnt. Um, luckily, no one was killed in the accident, but it is quite concerning when I hear that ambulance flying over the head and landing close by, because I only live a couple miles from this intersection. So maybe John has some comments that he- John. Yeah, through you, Warden H. In the road, is there anything we can do? <laughs> <laughs> um, and as I uh, informed Councillor Eggets yesterday, uh, just the last month, we added another additional safety device at that intersection. We painted stop bars uh, on on line 44 there. So, um, you, you know, this is the thing we pretty much added every additional safety device that, that we have in our arsenal. Um, and I did have staff check to ensure that all those devices are in good condition and, and in working order. Um, you know, that the road there is, uh, is, is a bit aged and uh, certainly the rumble strips have maybe lost a little bit of their intensity. Um, and we do have some projects here where we will be uh, milling in rumble strips on some of our capital projects and and over uh, by Bornholm. Um, so what I'm going to have staff do is during that time refresh those rumble strips at that intersection. Um, and, and but we have made sig significant uh, attempts at, at improving the safety at that intersection over the years. I guess and the other thing, people have asked for a four-way stop. What is the policy that we have on four-way stops? Like, would it be a contender or not? And again, uh, you, you know, it, it's it's a warrant process. And I, as I've said before, if we're to follow that warrant process, in all likelihood, we 
we just don't have the volume of traffic or the peak hour traffic on our roadways and or the, the high ac accident frequency. So um, that's, and I guess a little bit concerning. It's not that we have to follow the warrant process to a T, but uh, I think it's imperative that I dig a little deeper into this. Um, I, I have uh, reached out to my friends at the OPP and see if they can help me in any regard with some historical traffic data uh, and particularly in the areas, are there hot spots? Where are we seeing fatalities in and around the county? And, you know, not every situation gets addressed the same. And, and you need to know the details and the res why the accident happened in the first place. Um, you know, I, you know, just assuming yesterday when I heard about the accident, that was likely a failure to yield. Well, as I find out, um, it looks like they just blew the stop sign completely. And so you address those two measures uh, pretty much uh, a little differently here. And, and that's the idea of trying to refresh those rumble strips uh, and maybe avoid those, those types of accidents. So there's, there's not an easy solution to this. Um, and as I, I said, uh, you know, it leaves a lot of us asking the questions, what, what more can we do? Um, and, and that's why I may be suggesting looking into alternative uh, ideas and, and research and, and, other, and other areas that uh, we can look at here. Thank you. Oh, you. Uh, John mentioned it there. I was just going to suggest that uh, they do some homework and find out what the cause is. Are they blowing the stop sign or stopping and then just not paying attention to pull them out? So I think I those think have to be addressed different ways. John, 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 so. John can correct me if I'm wrong, but of all the serious accidents we've had lately, it's been a combination thereof, right? That's correct. You stopping and then pulling out in front or just blowing. Uh, through you, Warden Aitchison, that is correct. And one thing I think the OPP have certainly, and, and Stratford Police have both commented to me, and I think they both they commented in the, those uh, uh, EOC meetings is the the speed that they're seeing on these roadways uh, these days is is uh, has increased significantly uh, over the last few months, and it's. Uh, um, probably attributing to, to a number of these accidents that we're seeing. John, anybody else got any comments or questions? Don't see any. Uh, moving on. Next thing would be the Perth County Connect. So this is just, this portion here is only the, the, the rep, portion of the report that's public. We will be going into closed session later to deal with some of this, but this portion is public only. This is more of a housekeeping, this report. The serious discussion will take place here momentarily. <clears throat> Maggie, there we go. So through the warden and okay, the Maggie. Hear me okay? Sorry, on behalf uh, of the That's better. Good. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Transportation Steering Committee, I'd just like to provide a brief uh, update on the PC Connect transit system. So the committee met on September 15th and we're provided with a thorough report regarding the status of each project component. So as always, this report has been appended to, today, to today's report for your reference. So at County Council meeting on September 3rd, Council approved the recommendation to proceed with the target launch date of November 16th, 2020. Since this meeting, Voyago has informed the team that they've only been able to secure one bus for a service launch on November 16th. Although the status of the bus procurement is constantly changing, 
Wayago is confident that upon immediate completion of our service agreement, our permanent fleet will be delivered in January of 2021. The committee advised staff to continue working closely with Boyago to source an additional bus. However, frequent telephone and email conversations with Boyago have advised that the bus procurement delays continue to be an issue. While our full service requires two buses, proceeding with one bus until a permanent fleet arrives may be a valuable option as it will allow for the community to become familiar with the service and would allow us to gather operational data regarding the uptake and success of our service. So while considering a potential one bus launch strategy for November, we've developed three potential options. Uh, the first being we could launch one, only one of our two routes. So launching one route would allow for residents to get comfortable with a fully operational service. However, this option doesn't allow us to service the other half of the county, nor would we be able to gather that operational data um, of the alternative route. The second would be to launch a new route that covers all jurisdictions. So this option would allow for us to service the entire county. However, the route would become long and we would lose many of those benefits of our service, such as efficient round trips and aligning with um, shift start times of employers throughout the county. Also, marketing an entirely new a route for a short period of time may become confusing for residents who are new to the transportation, um, as well as they would need to become familiar with an entirely new route come January. Uh, the third would be to launch both routes and al alternate the service days. So for example, we could run route A on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and route B on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, with the possibility of alternating each route. So this option would allow for us to run our original daily schedule so that our res residents can familiar the familiarize themselves with the potential needs it can fulfill and the destinations that they can reach using the BC Connect. By moving forward with our full routes and daily schedules, we'll be able to heavily market the details of our service, indicating increased frequency come January 2021, rather than marketing entirely new routes and our daily schedules. It would also allow us to gather the accurate operational data as each route will be running full daily schedules. The steering committee did not reach a decision regarding a one bus launch strategy and deferred the decision to the county council meeting today. So we are seeking direction on how to proceed in the case that only one bus is available for a launch on November 16th. In terms of the agreements, I'm happy to confirm that Stratford has approved and signed the LPA and Stratford has approved, uh, provided verbal approval and will be taking the agreement to their next available meeting for signatures. Both the LPA and service agreement have been drafted in final form and they'll be further discussed later on in closed session. And so um, as well in closed session, our legal representative will be joining us to answer any outstanding questions or can concerns regarding either agreement. So with that, a uh, brief update and report is before you, and we welcome any questions or concerns that you may have. Okay, first, any questions for Maggie? You? Uh, did St. Mary's have their meeting yet? Their council meeting? Um, I. Sorry, through the warden, I believe they had a, um, a council meeting last week. However, due to the timing, uh, they weren't able to take our LPA with them. Uh, so they have advised that they will be taking it at their next available meeting. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, first and foremost, I have a motion. Perth County receives the Perth County Connect September update report for information. I have a question. Do we not, she asked, do we not have to figure out yeah, we are, but that's a that's, separate motion. Okay. I'm just telling you we're receiving the report. So does anybody want to move that motion? Uh, Daryl, seconder? Oh. Bob, those in favor? It's carried. Now, Maggie has asked that we deal with what we didn't deal with at our last transportation meeting, and that is the Either alternate days or whatever. What the schedule is. What, what the schedule is. Like they need to come up with some sort of answer so we can move on. 
Walter? Well, I think at that time at the last meeting, uh, we thought maybe if we postponed it to today, there would maybe be an update uh, from our provider as to whether there was any indication we would have another bus or not. And I'm gathering from what's been said, uh, there's been no update. Um, well, there's that. been an update. No, you won't have another bus till January. Is basically what they're saying. Am I not correct, Maggie? That's correct. Okay. No, that's I'm sorry to add to that. They're continuing to, to work on sourcing another bus, but they have advised that it's looking very unlikely until our permanent fleet is in. Unless somebody else cancels out and they move one over. You got to remember, we still haven't signed the agreement with them. So until we get that agreement formally signed, it makes it a little more challenging to get that second bus. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. So does somebody here? So I have a recommendation here that the new route services the entire county and alternating service days between the two routes be approved by council. So that means Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Correct? You can make through the warden. That's correct, right, Maggie? That's what it was before. Yes. That's correct. Do I have a mover or more questions? So, what, so if it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, does it switch to Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, the next week, or does it always stay Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Well, I guess that's going to be up to Maggie and the team to decide. Do you have a preference on that? Or does council have a preference on that? I know the comment made at the last meeting was that might get confusing. So I'm thinking if you started, you might want to stay Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the other out Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. That's what I was going to suggest that it stay since it's the same or else it gets too confusing because you don't know, like it's the same with gardens, unless it's on the calendar, sometimes it doesn't get to the end of the road. It gets you lose track, right? So I think people are going to lose track of which week they're on and which week that bus has come. So. Okay, well, do I have anybody willing to make that motion for alternate day service? You? Do I have a seconder? Matt Duncan. Any more con council questions, comments, concerns? Todd, did you have one? Well, I think you know that, that um... This, this motion uh, that is on the floor today, I, I will stand opposed to. And my rationale is a simple one, and, and maybe it's being too protective of North Perth's interests, but um, when I consider um, the, the primary outcomes that could be achieved by this bus for North Perth, uh, that will be moving uh, individuals to our industrial sector and, and to work in North Perth. And if you have a schedule, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, that means that workers still are reliant on a solution that is Tuesday, Thursday, which of course is, is, is impractical. So from uh, the, the perspective of gaining work-based ridership, um, my concern is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we're not going to get it. We're not going to see it in the early months. And, um, and from that perspective, um, I find myself uh, troubled by this, uh, this, this uh, effort. Uh, I understand that, that uh, you know, we're, we have a pig in a poke here. We have no option um, uh, with regards to having a second bus, but uh, I, I would rather look at uh, running a single route than running uh, every other day as has been proposed, um, uh, just because of the movement of people and the needs of employers to have people uh, moved to their location every day and not every other day. Okay, I agree with your comments, uh, Todd, uh, but unfortunately, you're right, we we're taking a poke. You know, if we had to got this moving along a little quicker and we were willing to decide on moving forward a little sooner, this wouldn't have been an issue, but I kind of thought I said I, that this was going to be an issue, and it is an issue. Rhonda, you have a question? Oh, I, no, I was just going to make the comments here. I echo what you're saying, and um, unfortunately, I'm hoping it's only going to be maybe a month and a half. I'm hoping that second bus is going to be here in January, and if it's not, I guess we're going to have to cross that bridge then, but it's 
I'm hoping it's only a temporary measure. And in January, we are going to be six days a week. So I, I know it's not ideal, but you know, as Jim said, we should have been moving on this and, we, and it didn't happen. And here we are today. So we have to deal with what we have in front of us. Okay, further comments or questions? We have a motion on the floor and it reads we'll operate on alternate days. So, so without rereading it. So through the warden, and that would be consistent. So it would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yep. Yeah. Tuesday, then Thursday, Thursday Saturday. Thursday, Saturday. That doesn't change. Nope. Okay. So sorry. Those in favor of that motion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's carried. You have your answer, Maggie. Thank okay. You. Uh, where are we at now? I know everybody here wants to stand and stretch. We have a couple bylaws we have to go through. And one of those is uh, the first bylaw is the one dealing with the OPA application. And that is bylaw 3772-2020 be read a first, second, and third time. And finally passed this first day of October, 2020. Moved by you, Rhonda, those in favor carried and the second motion it deals with the speed limit change and that is bylaw 3773-2020 be read a first second and third time and finally pass this first day of october bob you oh no todd finally got his hand up there we'll use todd uh those in favor it's carried uh notice the motions none New business, I think we dealt with Rhonda's issue. Does anybody else have other business? Any announcements? Okay, the next on the agenda is closed session. It takes a few minutes to set up. So it's time to stand, stretch, and washroom break or coffee fill or whatever. We're gonna recess for 10 minutes. And if you're going to the washroom, get your little mask on. Just so you know. We are recording. Okay, we're back in open session. I need a motion, or do you want to read something off you've got prepared? Certainly. Through the warden, we would, uh, for the community transportation program, we would like or ask for a resolution from council to authorize the warden and the clerk to execute agreements with Voyago and for the local partnership agreement. There you go. Do I have a mover? Doug Kellum. Do I have a seconder? That would be Bob Wilhelm. Any further comments or questions? Just, Bob? Just one comment that's as amended. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say before I that ask one. for the vote. Yep. Okay, so that includes that clause. Yep. Those in favor? That's unanimous. Very good. That pretty well concludes what we need to do with transportation. Yep. Yeah. So I'm at the confirmatory bylaw and bylaw 3773-2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council 
of the Corporation of the County of Burns at its regular meeting held October 1st, 2020, was read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed October 1st, 2020. Moved by. You, second by Todd. Those in favor? I have a motion that the County Council meeting be adjourned at 12.23 p.m. Moved by Bob Wilhelm, second by Carol Ehrlich. Those in favor? Carrie, thank you very much. Thanks, Todd and Doug.